Cause you're listening to Jams and Tea on see the show on your TV so we talk about things musically. Cause you're listening to Jams and Tea. You're listening to Jams and Tea. Welcome everyone to a brand new episode of the B-Sides of the Jams and Tea podcast where we, the three of us, Tyler Sarish and Jake are coming at you today with an episode covering a band that is quite, quite special. That of course being Frightened Rabbit. You read it in the title and now it is here and why don't I, I feel ill prepared to introduce frightened rabbit because i have only recently got into their music mm -hmm. relatively speaking i didn't get into it for this episode specifically i got into them several months ago actually when i was recommended their first technical first album um by you tyler um but i of course did not have the um sort of pre-established connection with them that you two had because you had listened to uh, at least the midnight organ fight before i had so go ahead there yeah i'm happy to introduce the band um so frightened rabbit were a um scottish indie rock with a touch of indie folk band uh they originally formed in the early 2000s in fact it, originally uh it was a solo project for um, frontman Scott Hutchison uh, for, for the purpose of recording I think demos and and um, early kind of eight track recordings and stuff um, and uh, eventually Scott was joined by his brother Grant who played drums uh, and they were soon accompanied by uh, Billy Kennedy on guitar for their first record and then Andy Monaghan for their second record onwards Gordon Skeen for their third and fourth records, I believe, and then later Simon Liddell for their final record. And each of these kind of rotating members has, um, I think, contributed guitar and also keyboards. So um, it has been a band with uh, a number of different members over the years, but at the heart, it has always been Scott and um, his brother Grant. Now, I'm presuming that um, basically everyone watching this is probably watching this because they're a fan of Frightened Rabbit or they have an interest in Frightened Rabbit or they're familiar with Frightened Rabbit as a band and the, uh, the story of Frightened Rabbit. So, but in case um, anyone is not, um, I should yeah, Because they're a less popular band, I think it's probably imperative that we yeah. provide context necessary yeah, here. I, I, I do feel... Um, uh, regardless, I should clarify from the outset that that Frightened Rabbit are no more. Uh, Frightened Rabbit uh, ended with the death of Scott Hutchison in May of 2018. Uh, and that is a fact that, uh, again, you're probably aware of if you're watching this, but I, if it's imperative for me to establish it from the outset because it's evidently going to be something that we refer to a lot um, throughout yeah. uh, our discussion of these mm -hmm. albums because... Um, Frightened Rabbit and Scott as a writer uh, had a very strong preoccupation with um, his emotional state, his psychological well-being, his experiences of depression uh, and anxiety and, and mental illness uh, informs a lot of the music. Alcoholism. We're about today. Alcoholism mm -hmm. as well. So consider this a very effusive content warning with regard to <laughs> all of those things. They will be discussed explicitly and in depth. A lot of our discussion, uh, I, I suspect, I mean, I know from on my part, is going to revolve around suicidal ideation uh, and suicide more generally. So um, yes, please be warned of that. Uh, and don't feel that you have this, to. This is generally going to be a very emotional, very messy discussion from all three of us. So yeah. we should warn you all from the outset. Yeah. It's going to happen. And it's, it's, we, yeah, that's, yeah. I mean, I look, I've prepared extensive notes for the purpose, uh, extensive scripts as have rather, I. for the purpose of having something to tether me in this, because I feel that... Uh, I, I have even practiced one particular section of this. Sometimes it's appropriate to sort of go off script, and, and there probably will be points where I do do that. Um, but generally speaking, I think that it's going to be necessary more than ever for me to have something to stick to, mm -hmm. so as not to kind of lose it a little bit, a little bit because ultimately, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, you know, you want this to be watchable, even if it is uh, an emotional experience, which it will inevitably mm -hmm. and undeniably be. So, yeah, so Frightened Rabbit, uh, indie rock, Scottish indie rock act, uh, and yeah, they came to prominence in the early 2000s and uh, mid 2000s. So, um, 
yeah, is there, I don't really, I mean, you guys can talk about your kind yeah. of context for the band as Sorry. we kind of go along if you want, but does anyone want to add anything yeah. before we, um, no, no, absolutely. Start? I mean, uh, just to clarify, uh, they had several albums under the name before I can grab it. We're going to talk about, yep. uh, Single Grey, Spin Night Organ, Fight Winter, Mixed Drinks, through to Panic, Panic, yeah. Panic Attack. We're also going to talk about a couple briefly, uh, Scott solo projects, which the band were heavily involved in. Yep. Um, yep. So we will talk about um, the, the L John solo project from 2014 and the Master System, uh, solo project from 2018. And we'll talk about all of these records in chronological order. Yes. So we'll kind yes. of paint a journey of the trajectory of this band. Yes. And and Scott as all of the records paint a pretty distinct artistic uh, uh, development over the course of the career yeah, um, I haven't included, I've only included Frightened Rabbit songs in my top 10 just to stick to That's fair. Uh, the theme of the episode um, I, I, I have, didn't because I couldn't <laughs> no, that's fair enough um, I, I have sort of written a little bit about my backstory uh, with the band, but if uh, Jake wants to talk a little bit about his context first, I'd be happy for that to happen. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's up to the two of you. It's up to the two of you whether you want to establish that context now or whether you feel it would be more appropriate for a particular record discussion. Well, I just I, feel like... I think that it's brief, so I think we can go in and sort of like just everyone will know, yeah. I, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, I just I feel like... it's pretty brief. Order, yeah in order to um, properly understand what I have to say later yeah. about the music, there's some things that's important to get out of the way about how I feel about the band right up front. Sure. Well, please go ahead. Okay. Right. Um, when I think of Frightened Rabbit, I think of a very specific uh, time in my life. There are two important things uh, to know about my relationship to their music, to Scott Hutchison's music. Uh, the first is that at this time to which I refer, I... I was not an album person, I was a song person. So these are all first time full listens for me this episode, even with my back history with the band. Uh, this period of my life, also, I was a total mess. Um, coming off the back of probably the most traumatic period of my life when I was dealing with feelings of guilt, people I'd inadvertently hurt, trying to do the right thing, a lot of, a lot of trauma, a lot of mistrust. A lot of just wanting to get on with things. This was partnered with maybe being the first period for a long time at that point where I really had tangible hope for myself. Spending a lot of time finding out about myself, exploring my burgeoning gender identity and exactly what my past means, the person I've become as a result of what happened in that past. Uh, this combination of trauma and hope strangely dovetails well with where I am with my life now, coming back to this music. Uh, this was why I started listening to the band. And before I can elaborate, I need to talk about the second thing, which is why I stopped listening to them about two years ago. Um, we've already referred to Scott's death. He, he disappeared in May of 2018. Um, I'm, I'm going to go into some sort of illusionary specifics. Um, his, his body was found on the banks of a, of a marina after the police have searched the surrounding area around Fourth Road Bridge. It's important to say that the coroner has not listed an official cause of death. Um, he has not ruled on what happened, um, but some tweets that I do not feel comfortable repeating that Scott made that night and the family statement imply suicide. Um, I don't want to confirm either way. It's not my place. But um, I feel similarly, but still differently enough to how I feel about the lead singer of Brand New. Um, who I got into about the same time um, when the facts of his sexual predation came to light. Frightened Rabbit's music has constantly been about fighting the inner demons that lead towards sadness and depression. Brand News has constantly been about fighting the worst sides of yourself. And in both cases, you realize that their music speaks to those aspects of yourself. And when you see what Lacey did, it feels like he lost that battle with the worst sides of himself. And by extension, that means that you could also. And this is why I stopped listening to Frighten Rabbit's music, because as someone who struggles so much with mental health and with guilt and self-hatred, the idea that he might have taken his own life scares me, puts me so starkly in touch with that side of myself. And I go back to their music with the distance I have now, and what I realized was something approaching a cautious shock and then euphoria, is how deeply hopeful I forgot Frightened Rabbit's music was. 
especially songs like Swim Until You Can't See Land, feel like glimmers of hope for a better future amongst the fog of war. And in a way, what used to be the problem, that huge amount of hope that inspired me, knowing what happened. Um, however, if there's one thing these realists have taught me, is that I agree with what the family statement said. It's that Scott's life and music should not be remembered for the sobering way it ended, but the joy it brought so many people, including myself. It's beautiful and well seen. Gorgeous. I, I also think that be I'll I, I will discuss it more in depth when I get to a particular album, but that beautifully ties into something I have to say about the final Frightened Rabbit record. So I, I'm glad you said that. Um, I would just say that I, as as a relatively new fan of their music, especially in comparison to Sersha and Tyler, um, I go through phases where I latch on to a band because of a and bands and albums just because of my emotional connection because I tend to relate to music the most strongly when it has to deal with my emotional state uh, which is mostly not great uh and like Sersha my the first band that I really properly did that with was in fact brand new uh, and over the past couple of months, that band has become Frightened Rabbit, just because I'm tailing off a difficult part in my life. If you know anything about me in reference to specifically my uh, segment on Punisher by Phoebe Bridgers that we did on the podcast, um, it's for very similar reasons. I, and for very similar reasons as Sersha, I just identify with a lot of the subject matter, and it's it's a very, there, there's an internal battle, I feel like, when you confront art like this, and it's really sort of a, not to <laughs> make an, an, a very apt metaphor here that Scott has made on literally some songs we will mention, but there is a sink or swim kind of deal with <laughs> this music of it could very much help you or it could very much be too much for you. And I understand either way, uh, though the case I will present today is very holistic in nature, and I hope to maybe share my feelings and affinity for this band, project, whatever, and for Scott himself in some capacity for some people, and I hope that maybe someone somewhere listening will get something good out of that, because I know sharing and talking about this kind of thing is not only uh, good for the discussion of art, but I believe therapeutic in a way few things can be or are. Yeah, also well said. Um, and I just want to comment as well that um, uh, just to build on on what Sersha said, uh, referencing uh, what the what Scott's family has said. Certainly, um, the Frightened Rabbit as a project and Scott as an artist um, should be remembered for the joy primarily that the music brought people. Uh, but that said, I am going to linger a lot on the darkness of the music in this discussion. Uh, and it is not necessarily um, a matter of feeling that that darkness or suicidality is the predominant takeaway from the music, but simply that there's a resonance to it um, and, you know, a just directness about it that uh, I just can't avoid or really circle around. Um, so that's gonna be, uh, particularly when we get to um, painting and when we get to the Master System record, uh, it's gonna be particularly a focal point there. Um, but yeah, anyway, my relationship with, with Frightened Rabbit. So I uh, became a Frightened Rabbit fan in September of 2015. So that's actually, just realizing now, pretty much exactly five years ago. Um, in my wow. last year of high school. Uh, and I got into, I, I discovered the Midnight Organ fight and I adored it. I had a very transformative experience with it. The first time I heard it, it was one of those instant favorites where just everything just clicked straight away about the record. I quickly became a fan of their other records at the time as well. Um, yeah, and, and beyond that, uh, the only kind of Brighton Rabbit record that I was kind of present for the release of was Painting of a Panic Attack. And I will uh, get into 
that experience when we talk about that record. Um, but yeah, I, I have been a fan uh, consistently for that time, for the time that I've been aware of them. Uh, I've followed them closely and I've had a really close and intimate relationship with the music both before and after Scott's passing. Um, and though that passing has certainly contextualized some things, I basically feel very similarly about all of it as to how I've always felt, uh, even while, while Scott was was still alive. Like my feelings haven't really changed. Um, it's, it's fantastic, beautiful and moving music. And I hope that we can get that across in a way that is meaningful to others. But yeah, so let's begin then. We'll start, um, so the early days, um, Scott and Grant were mucking around with demos and, and, and their early attempts at songwriting. Uh, I need to bring my notes up now. Uh, they, yeah, Billy Kennedy joined them um, to add electric guitar to their uh, initial, to their kind of early project. And we got um, their first release, uh, I believe it originally released, originally released in 2006. And then it was reissued uh, the following year once the band signed to Fat Cat Records, but it was initially released um, yeah. on, a, on a much smaller label. Uh, and and I don't I don't know if it was self produced or not I'm not too sure but their initial release Sing the Grays came out in 2006, um, and there's definitely seeds of the songwriting um, and the sound uh, that was to come on this record but it is very much um, a still Scott I think finding his voice uh, it does it it it. It's quite lo-fi and very like, clearly low budget, and it is certainly rough around the edges. Um, the seeds of the songwriting um, that you kind of see blossom beautifully on Midnight Organ Fight are definitely here. Um, the band's rudimentary indie rock sound is here, and there's also an attempt at the musical layering of their later albums, though there's not yet a sound nor mixing that's fulsome enough to do it justice. Um, but it's still a decent beginning, uh, if an unassuming one. Um, the Grays is a really strong uh, opening track. I think uh, it has a driving melody and an almost post-rocky build across its sub-three-minute runtime. Um, although issues do kind of arise pretty quickly, um, the predominant one being that Scott is barely audible on this record. Uh, his, his voice is very faint. Was waiting for that. Uh, Music now, the second track has a bit of a stronger melody, though again, you have Scott's lyricism just feeling nowhere near as developed and as fascinating and as catchy as it would soon become. It's, it's very simplistic. Um, it almost feels like uh, placeholder lyrics in a lot of senses. Um, and this is a problem that unfortunately does persist on most of the record and, and notably on tracks like Yawns and Be Less Rude, which I think strain towards making interesting observations about relationships that do kind of fall short of that. Uh, that said, there's still an emotional quality to the melodies here. There's, there's a definite talent for melody that's kind of, not again, not fully realized, but it shows promise. Um, and there's also an irreverence to the attitude that's pro the, probably the most winning quality about seeing the Greys is, is just how irreverent the attitude is. I mean, for example, the line on music now, let's make music that some cunt might like, um, <laughs> that clearly shows a band that aren't taking themselves too seriously. Uh, and, and indeed, at the time many of these songs were written, the band was just Scott and Grant, and the comparatively simplistic lyricism perhaps resent represents their modest aims at the time. Uh, on the song Go Go Girls, Scott sums this up in a plain but affecting sentiment. Uh, this is me and my brother giving blood on the street tonight. Uh, I think the best song on the record by far is Square Nine, uh, which is the only track here I yep. think that really stands up with what they would go on to do, uh, even if it does still lack the finesse and strength of their future record highlights. Um, all bands do have to start somewhere. And I mean, to me, this does play more like a series of, of demos or even like a, an EP embellished with pointless interludes than an actual fully fledged album. Um, but no discussion of, of, of the progression of Frightened Rabbit as an act and of Scott as a songwriter. 
would be complete without acknowledging it. Um, it's definitely a humble beginning, uh, and we'll see very soon that there was a, a particularly gigantic leap in quality uh, once the band realized that there was interest in them as an act uh, from this project. But yeah. Yes, I agree with most of what you've said. Um, I think my problem with it isn't anything as specifically technical as the vocal mixing. I just think it's just more boring than anything else I've made. Um, like, when I, I, I've spent my life listening to their best songs, um, this just feels like a lot of the ideas are there and a lot of um, the, the techniques in structuring and ways that terms of phrases are built, um, they are there. Um, but uh, there's none of the uh, real sharpness to any of the writing. Uh, the Greys, I agree, is a fine opener, one of my favourite songs on the track. Um, I find music now utterly forgettable and slightly vapid, um, but there are some songs that hint at what they would do on the next record and going forward with interesting instrumentation like... Uh, be Less Rude and, uh, and Square Nine. Uh, Behave is also a song I enjoy quite a lot. Um, yeah. Um, also, the version I listened to, it ended with a live rendition of The Greys, which yeah. I found slightly pointless. Um, but yeah, I think that was yeah. just on, added to the reissue when yeah. they um, did the second yeah. version of it. Yeah. Probably yeah. true. Um, which is fine. Like, The Greys is one of the better songs on the track. Uh, but if you remember the Leon Lahavis project we talked about before, it's like you already had the song that once. Yeah, I, I think perhaps that was the point of including on the reissue was perhaps to entice people to see the band as a live yeah. act. Um, mm-hmm. I think that's probably true. And, and a, which is a form that I've heard that even in their early days they were fantastic and uh, and really mm-hmm. powerful. But um, but yeah. Doesn't quite yeah, no, capture absolutely. it here. They're just still <laughs> a little bit haven't quite found it their sound yet. No, no, absolutely. But yeah, like it's kind of disappointing. Like we've talked about. I feel like you can divide the acts that we've talked about on this season into like two halves, where where you can hype, you know, very famous acts that we love a lot and we talk about them a lot, and then when you have to talk about their first record, it's like, wow, they really came out of the, the gate swinging. You know, you have your, your D. Louse and the Comatoriums and your Men Alive and your Axl Roses being reinvented. Um, but we've also talked about bands like, so, uh, yeah. well, <laughs> acts like Sufjan Stevens, for example. Oh, yeah. Or, <laughs> where yeah. you hype them up a lot and then you have to talk about their first record yeah. where... The sound just ha- or, or adrenaline. Death tones, for also. Example. Yeah, adrenaline. Yeah. Just, but, but yeah, um, yeah. I, I I do see this as really just existing in order to get attention and in order to get enough, hopefully, secure a label signing so that they could make something where they actually yeah. have money to put into what they want to do, and that is what happened. So, I mean, I know a lot about doing things just for attention, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Any, anyway, I'm kind of disappointed I don't have more to say. I just want it to oh, be I just, better. Yeah, I, I don't have much to say either. Look, Sersha, let's, let's be real. What can truly be dissected <laughs> about the Greys? I mean, like, I, if you came out and were just like, yeah, thousand words on this thing, let's fucking go, I would be <laughs> astonishingly impressed. Um, not to shit talk it too hard. Like, here's the thing is that when I was writing segment, I, I wrote uh, something for, for every core Frightened Rabbit album. And it really should tell you all that you need to know that I was like, oh shit. Yeah. The grays. Um, <laughs> and I, the, 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 and the segment, uh, which I wrote for this consists of uh, one word, which is, yeah. It's and fine. that's kind of, yeah, that's sort of my um, overall opinion. Like, I'm not going to stray from Serge and Tyler here at all. I think it is, like, on the one hand, I'm kind of, like, I'm a bit miffed just because every f- other Frightened Rabbit album, you know, like, I'm, I don't think any of us are going to bury the lead here. Every other Frightened Rabbit album is fucking amazing. Yeah. And then there's this. So it's like their track record is so fucking consistent and so good 
except for this. That said, it was a necessary step to take. If you had, if you wanted the Midnight Organ fight, you had to get through the Greys. And you know, if that's the sacrifice we have to pay, then we have to pay it. The problem is they made the other two album, the other albums <laughs> too good. Yeah, yeah. And that's that's the problem here is yeah. that when I went into this, I had heard every other Frightened Rabbit record, yeah. and I went into this, and it's just like, oh God, I just can't be anything but painfully underwhelmed even when I adjust my expectations just because there's like there I mean even for like an early act I feel that Sing the Greys is just a bit malformed a bit too rickety for its own good not to say like the like the production's super bad I mean it's really not and with this type of music I kind of expect that it's just the songwriting is not as great. I agree. I think that Square Nine and The Greys and even Go-Go Girls, decent songs, worth listening to. Uh, they will not even come close to approaching my top 25. Uh, I mean, it's just not possible. Uh, they also show some of their weaknesses here with the pointless interlude tracks, um, which are definitely at their worst and least interesting here. And then there's also just the issue of the songwriting, like particularly on music now for me, that just feels really, as Sersha said, vapid. It's just like, this just doesn't have the spirit that the other records have. And I, I just, I feel mm. like maybe if they had, it's, it's like 30 minutes long, it's not that big. But you know, if you cut two songs and maybe like focused really hard on the other stuff here and maybe like refined it a little bit better. This would be something that I would totally revisit. Instead, I genuinely don't think I'll ever listen to this again. Not that it's, you know, bad. It's just like, I just get nothing out of it that I don't get 10 times better on fucking the Midnight Organ Fight or Winter of Mixed Drinks. So yeah. Yeah, no. I, I think that, that, that we could probably leave. There's no, no need yeah. to labor that point. No. But, um, Let's move it on. It's uh, good that we start light, though. You know, just yeah, something easy yeah. to talk about, it's just so to true. get those the wheels spinning. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right. Yeah. So tracks ratings. Mm. Yep. Let's go. So should you? Yeah. Off. All right. I'll kick you off. My favorite tracks were the Greys. Um, I'm say be less rude, and I'm gonna say behave. Um, my least favorite is probably music now. I'm gonna give this record a five out of ten. Cool. That's fair enough. Jake, do you want to go? Yeah, uh, my favorites are The Greys, um, Square Nine, and Go-Go Girls. Uh, least favorite, I'll uh, piggyback Sersha and say Music Now. And uh, I also give it a 5 out of 10. Okay. Love to see it. Um, my three favorite tracks are going to be The Greys. Uh, well, Square Nine is my favorite, The Greys. And I'll also throw in Be Less Rude. Uh, my least favorite track, not counting the interludes, is Yawns. Uh, and I will be a little bit more generous, and I'll give this a very light 6 out of 10. Okay. Very Okay, now it begins. Now it begins. Okay, I was gonna so... Say, and <laughs> now they're all great! <laughs> so, so, they signed to Fat Cat uh, in, in 2007, uh, t during which uh, Sing the Grays was reissued. Uh, and they recorded um, the Midnight Organ Fight. Um, okay, so uh, some context for the re recording. Um, or just maybe I'll just launch into my review, I guess. Uh, it doesn't really matter. Um, so Midnight Organ Fight. The breakup album as a concept has had a fraught and storied history. And everyone has their picks for the best or the most heartfelt ones. Some that come to mind for me include Springsteen's Tunnel of Love, which we have reviewed on this podcast. Blur's 13, another personal favorite of mine. Beck's Sea Change, Marvin Gaye's Hear My Dear, Fleetwood Mac's Rumors, and of course, Bob Dylan's Blood on the Tracks. For me, though, none cut deeper than the jagged, ugly edges of the midnight organ fight which wrestles with the myriad of complicated and fucked up emotions you feel in the wake of a particularly messy ending. Uh, worth noting here, the band were aided 
uh, by the skillful and more polished production of Peter Catus, uh, whose credits include Gang of Youths, Go Father and Lightness, Interpol, <laughs> Shit. Interpol, Makes so much sense. Interpol's Turn on the Bright Lights, The Twilight Sad, the fuck? 14 Autumns, 15 Winters, and Nobody Wants to Be Here, Nobody Wants to Leave, Sharon Van Etten's Tramp, and every single national album. So, wow. so Jake Tyler and Sersha Core literally is this dude's brand. It, it, to be fair, like the sound of Frank Rabbit's career is almost like the complete, over the course of all of their albums, like the complete melding of all of those records. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, it is. Peter Caters is basically the god of indie production, uh, and he's a, and it's fair yeah, to say apparently. he's a safe pair of hands if you want to make an indie record that sounds great and immediately the sound improvement in terms of how this is produced uh, from Sing the Greys before you even dig into the songs themselves is apparent. Uh, this is a record that sounds awesome. Uh, it kicks off with The Modern Leper, which is uh, an instant classic uh, that has since endured as one of the band's most beloved, recognizable and acclaimed songs. The insistent galloping melody supports instantly iconic writing from Scott, uh, which details a broken relationship through the metaphor of a leper with limbs hanging off and a rotted heart. Uh, it's a tremendous piece of indie folk that blossoms into a full-on electric banger, uh, leaps and bounds ahead of their debut, and beginning a run during which the band would never put their foot wrong. Uh, I Feel Better is a great and frankly underappreciated song in which Scott wrestles with his lingering emotions toward the person who the song confirms is now out of his life. Though declaring, early, th though declaring this early in the record that this is the last song I'll write about you is a winking acknowledgement of the seeming impossibility of moving on. Good Arms versus Bad Arms is another phenomenal song capturing Scott's jealousy and torment at being left behind for someone else. But with more than a fair dose of humor and irreverence in lines like, uh, I am armed with the past and the will and a brick. The mid song breakdown and instrumental rebuild in this track is one of my favorite parts of the entire album. And it makes the final iteration of that chorus even more devastating as Scott finally strips back his facade and the final lines to concede, leave the rest at arm's length. I'm not ready to see you this happy. Leave the rest at arm's length. I'm still in love with you. Can't admit it yet. Fast Blood is ostensibly a song about sex. Um, not the last time that this topic will be examined lyrically uh, in a particularly vivid, vivid way by Scott. And he manages to make it sound terrifying, life-threatening and ugly with some of the record's most vivid lyricism. Let's get paralyzed down both sides, snake hips, red kiss, and your black eyes roll back. The fast blood hurricanes through me and then rips my roof away. Now I tremble because this fumble has become biblical. I feel like I just died twice and was reborn again for all our dirty sins. I mean, this is not going to be the first time where it's just like, sometimes all I can do is just quote lyrics because that just... <laughs> I mean, like the lyricism is like, there's, it's no matter who reads it or in what intonation, it just sounds so inherently poetic. Yeah. Like it, it oof. Yeah, it, it's, it, Scott is a or Scott was a gifted and incredibly talented writer who uh, has a fantastic skill for finding incredibly literary and and potent metaphors um, for uh, the uh, most simple and and universal elements of of relationships. The energetic, distorted melody of this song, Fast Blood, mirrors these sentiments fantastically. It feels you get you get that rush of 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 of, of um, that sexual energy is, is all over the song and it sounds terrifying. Um, the record does peer back the energy briefly for the more traditionally folky old, old fashioned, which initially seems to be a plea from Scott to his partner to leave behind the excesses and technology of modern society until eventually you realize the whole thing is just an elaborate metaphor for begging his ex to return to an earlier part of their lives where their love was still mutual. 
let's get old fashioned back to how things used to be. If I get old fashioned, will you get old fashioned with me? The album's first half climaxes with the insistent piano driven energy of the twist which is another just emotionally devastating track, which sees Scott indulging his fantasies that the person he cares for might also feel the same way as him, before ultimately conceding that reality is irrelevant and that he can live inside the fantasy that they do regardless. Twist and whisper the wrong name, I don't care and nor do my ears, eventually becomes twist and whisper the right name, I'm David, please a full embrace of a fantasy that is not his reality before convincing himself in the final lines, the twist is that you're just like me. You need company. You need human heat. For anyone who has been alone in their own powerful and unrequited feelings, it's nearly unbearable in how close to the bone it cuts. Following the instrumental interlude, Bright Pink Bookmark, we get a trio of three songs that together makes one of the best three track runs in all of indie rock mm -hmm. and all of folk and all of whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't really begin to overstate how good these three songs are. Head rolls off. Like Modern Leper has become a signature track for the band. And that refrain of I'll make tiny changes to earth has acquired a particular resonance since Scott's death. And I'm actually wearing a t-shirt right now that has that quote oh. on it. Um, oh. Yeah, that came, that was uh, that. a little bit of, um, of, of merch that, that came out um, after Scott's passing. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a line that has acquired a particular resonance since his death, an emblem of the effect he has had on the world and the impact each person can have that depression tries to disguise or to render trite. Here, Scott acknowledges the meaninglessness of his own existence, but it's not a source of defeat or of nihilism. In the lines, when it's all gone, something carries on. It's not morbid at all. It's just when nature's had enough of you. When my blood stops, someone else's will not. When my head rolls off, someone else's will turn. While I'm alive, I'll make tiny changes to earth. It's the most uplifting song on the record. And to be quite frank, it is the last time that anything on this <laughs> album is remotely uplifting. Uh, when my backwards walk kicks in, we're immediately thrown into that darker state of mind, the harshness of a reality where any effort to make tiny changes is complicated by the black wall of emotional noise pushing Scott away from the future. It's one of the best breakup songs of all time. Uh, and this, one of the strongest other contenders is also later on this album. The emotions here are universal and have maybe never been expressed more acutely or more poetically. And the passion in, in Scott's vocal delivery on this track rends every bit of pathos out of them. They are the exasperated words of a lifetime of pain that bubble to the surface. Uh, if, if my backwards walk is pain, and sadness directed inwards, then keep yourself warm as the vitriol of a scorned lover bursting the floodgates and flowing freely. The writing on this song is less poetic and more blunt, but no less colorful. Can you see in the dark? Can you see the look on your face? The flashing white lights being turned off. You don't know who is in your bed. It takes more than fucking someone to keep yourself warm. Here, as throughout the album, credit is due to the perfectly tuned rhythms of Grant and the fantastic guitar work of Billy Kennedy, who ratchets up the distortion and the noise as the song goes on, climaxing in an overwhelming fury at its peak. And it just represents a moment of pure catharsis, I think. Uh, following the interlude, Extra Super Very, we get the record's most nakedly emotional song to me, and my favorite, I think. Uh, Poke is the song where the built-up 
complicated emotions Scott has to his ex all kind of flood together and overlap, creating a complicated, volatile, entirely overwhelming expression of pure grief. Uh, it's immediately clear from how high and intimately the vocals are mixed on this song over Scott's plaintive strumming. And Scott intones bluntly lines like, why won't our love keel over as it chokes on a bone and we can mourn its passing and then bury it in snow or should we kick its cunt in and watch as it dies from bleeding mm. if you don't want to be with me just say and i will go if you haven't experienced these emotions such an expression might seem overbearing melodramatic but the way that Scott foregoes words entirely during the song's chorus, an anguished but gentle, wordless howl, confirms that the emotions are real and, and frankly unbearable. There's an audible quaking in his voice during the song's final lines, which are so haunting that I don't even want to read them. The entire second verse of the song has some of the most raw and beautiful writing about relationships that I have ever, ever read. Choice lines include, we can change our partners, this is a progressive dance, but remember it was me who dragged you up to the sweating floor. And another personal favorite of mine, if someone took a picture of us now, they'd need to be told that we had ever clung and tied a navy knot with arms at night. I mean, that's fucking poetry right there. Mm. Um, yeah. So that song is uh, very special to me and very difficult to listen to. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's nothing, though, compared to the next song, which I haven't even written notes on. Uh, and I don't even really know if I'm going to talk about in much detail. Like, I, I purposefully kind of gone a bit quickly through some of these songs because i know that the two of you will have plenty to add of your own um but but floating in the fourth uh i mean i probably don't need to tell anyone who's listening what this song is about i mean we have already provided the context that scott's body was found uh in south queens ferry uh not very far from the fourth road bridge um so yeah Uh, this is not the last time that Scott indulge, indulges in a suicide fantasy uh, in his writing or imagines uh, surrendering himself to the ocean, um, to the world. Uh, it's certainly one of the most direct uh, lyrical readings of that. I mean, and it... And it yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I don't know what to say about this song. Um, except to say that it, <laughs> until the 10th of May 2018, it was an uplifting song. <laughs> it was, because yeah, it, yeah, is about, is it, it is about stepping to the edge and then stepping away and, and making that conscious decision to step away, uh, at least for now. Um, it's and I mean, like in the context of the record as well, like it's about it's about stepping away from your grief, stepping away from the, the emotions that are lingering in you about this person, about this relationship, about this, you know, this mindset. It's about, you know, realizing you can and, and, and fighting to be able to make that step to move forward and move away from the darkness and move away from um, not losing yourself in it uh and it's just <laughs> yeah it's yeah i mean the first time i heard the midnight organ flight well, i was it was a monday evening uh and i just i was about halfway through the album i think I was sitting in at home halfway through the album and eventually i just realized what i need to do as I need to get in my car and just drive and listen to the rest of it there. 
because I just, it wasn't right sitting at home listening to it. I couldn't, I wasn't alone and I needed to be alone. And I just drove to the beach and I remember getting to the beach and listening to Poke and floating in the fourth and just sitting there and watching the waves. And I'm not going to say it was like a profound moment or anything like that. It's just, it was just a perfect moment. And I felt a connection to Scott and I felt, I felt that this was a record that uh, was made for someone like me, was made for people like me. I, there was made, there was a, re, there was a resonance throughout all of it uh, that even if I had not experienced all the same things that Scott had experienced uh, and even if the, the pain I felt was not as great as the pain Scott had felt that we we at least shared something and and yeah and that was how i became a frightened rabbit fan and i'll elaborate more on that later as we go on um but i mean i consider the midnight organ fight to be a basically perfect record it it captures as i said it captures all these all the myriad of emotions and, and emotional turmoil that you experience because of relationships and in relationships and 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 dealing with how all encompassing and your feelings can be for another person, especially when you don't feel all that strongly about yourself. Um, it's acute and it's painful and it's, and it's perfect. Yeah. And I'll stop. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to stop there on this one. Okay. That's, that's fair enough. Just um, on the subjects of floating in fourth, um, because I wrote in my thing I want to say about it that I'm going to leave it to the other people who probably have more to say and you've also done this so I'm going to elaborate a bit on it now um, in that um, I feel like what I've grown to realise about Frightened Rabbit which I tried to express in my introductory passage about how I feel about the band is that just like what you learn from this music, I think is more more than anything else. Just because, like, we should take the the fight that Scott put in to the force for positivity as a really big lump of what the music. Or I do anyway for what a big chunk of what the music means to me now. And I think that just because Scott lost this this potentially lost this battle, that sh if he did, that shouldn't mean that we can't take the lessons he espouses in his music as a hugely positive influence. And for example, when the line on Floating in Fourth, um, I think I'll save suicide for another day, rings out, I still take that. I still take that as a hugely uplifting and inspirational thing because I I forget the history. I get carried along in the fight yeah. against these demons. Yeah, and, and you're right. It is a song about about having the fight in you and about fighting. Uh, it is not a song about losing. Um, and, and you're right, that is so important to remember. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I, I guess I'll keep talking and go into what I uh, sort of had to say about the record, I guess. Um, on this record, we see Fright and Rabbit significantly strip back their sound to a more explicitly folky vibe, which of course appeals to me. Um, while working elements of Americana, Gaelic, traditional music, and country into their sound. And there's also a pronounced increase in the level of eloquence with which, with which the themes are attacked. Uh, it's clear that this is an arrival for the band that culminates in one of the best albums ever made. I'm going to agree with Tyler and say I think this is probably a perfect record. Um, this progression of skill and vision is nowhere better demonstrated than the opener of the modern leper. One of the best songs ever made. Um, he uses a long-worn metaphor of externalizing your mental illnesses and sadness and physical deformity or monsterhood. Um, anything that would externalize the way you feel outcast by society. Um, it takes this idea, makes a song that, that, that blends fun and melancholy like a perfect tightrope walk. Um, and the way the song makes all of the instruments sound whole, full, and organic give the song such grounded tangibility that makes you feel like you are racing into the earth of a Scottish moor and rooting around in the soil uh, for, the, for the emotions of the very land itself. 
I feel better combines bass and drums into a phenomenally tight rhythm section um, where uh, and good arms and bad arms combines an Americana aesthetic with a syncopated ooh ooh vocals and wailing guitars into this kaleidoscopic yet immeasurably hooky and buoyant song about trying hard to move on whilst working hard also to be a better person, keeping your bad parts at arm's length. And we then get maybe the two most fun tracks on the record. First Blood is one of the more rocky tracks um, on the record and Old Old Fashioned is, is a delightful melancholy love song um, that combines this catchy as fuck bass riff with mandolin giving it an incredible pace. It's a song about simultaneously wanting to hide from the world and love one another and wanting to grow all together while being acutely aware that the relationship is functionally over or dying or dead. Um, or it is not up to what it used to be when, and you miss the salad days of the relationship. In a way, this shows how the closest people we have can be sources of pleasure and pain at once, seeking solace in your love, but being pained at your conflict. It captures the hermetically sealed nature of a, that a close relationship can have, and the potentially toxic nature of a relationship like that. It's also really fucking fun. Um, let's get old, old fashioned back to how it used to be get old fashioned with me. Um, so give me soft, soft static with a human voice underneath. We can both get old fashioned. Um, and then put the brakes on these fast, fast wheels. Other highlights include the interlude bright pink bookmark, the haunting and uplifting floating and forth, which I've already talked about. Um, I would be remiss though, not to talk about maybe my favorite back to back list track listing on any album, that being my backwards walk and keep yourself warm. Um, I started to cover my backwards chord on piano the other day. The chords are relatively easy if you know how to make them sound really nice. And before I realized that I was lost in the slow build this song has, the way each verse builds an emotional intensity as you explore this sordid relationship and the feelings of guilt and stagnation. It's impossible to play the song and not feel yourself get caught up in, get caught up in it. By the end, I was shouting through, through tears and I never realized when I'd started crying. The warm, Rough, heady mixture of gruff guitars and plucking acoustics and the harmonica gives you this warm, heady feeling that you are, are lost in your own dream space of hazy memory and regrets, drunk enough at the bar to transcend into your own traumatized reminiscing. I wish we'd never met, then met today, epitomizes the ideas of the song. You are you are the best person who met me at the wrong time, and now it's forever fucked. And we can never move past where we are. We are trapped in this spiral of endless arguing and hatred and resentment, yet we can't escape each other's gravity like two planets destined to collide. It's a song about trying hard to be better, but still feeling guilty for those you've hurt in the bad times, which is something that I have under my deepest hidden stones and often refuse to turn over. I keep these ideas hidden and part of me that I, I, I fear I have just become who I am, like a long hidden fossil in me and the song forces me to confront and deal with this aspect of myself, which is probably a good thing. Um, I'm trying to draw a straight line, but I just can't seem to get one right. It evokes in me my constant efforts to self-improve and be a better person, but always feeling like I'm failing. I'm working on erasing you. I just don't have the proper tools. There's no way I'm forgetting this. My clothes won't let me close the door because my trousers seem to love your floor. The lines about there's nowhere else for me to go speak to the final, utterly horrible realisation of the song. That the title, My Backwards Walk, refers to both refers both to the act of trying to get back to the emotional state you used to be in before things got bad. It, it refers to the act of repair, but also the inevitable journey through ground you trod through. That's like a bog that you get stuck in as you retrace your steps. It's the act of falling in reverse, trying to get up and walking backwards. Um, as if reverse has been pressed on your life by a malevolent God, forcing you back into the same traps. Yet the most powerful thing about the song is how much love it is told with, how warm the music is. It is a song resigned to its fate and accepting that all you can do is feel the love it feels for the person in the song. Keep Yourself Warm is a different proposition entirely. This is the song that deeply inspired um, a song on my last EP called Nothing Will Change. 
Um, it starts off with a sticky organ riff that builds the atmosphere tremendously before the repeating dirge-infused yet bouncy guitar line comes in. If we have a hormone race, I'm bound to finish first. It's a perfect one to encapsulate the energy of the song. When the flashing white lights have been turned off, you don't know who's in your bed. The song evokes the same melancholy devastation of the day after the party of LCD sound systems, all my friends. The song speaks to the impulse to engage in casual sex and relationships as a way to fill the deep hole inside yourself. This is a deeply destructive act, mainly because you are in no way considering the feelings of the other person um, in your co-option of them into your own hell. This is unfortunately something I can also relate to and have in the past engaged in. In the same way though, when the initial correction, when the initial connection happens, the song captures that and beautiful vodka drenched poetry. The song builds up itself into a way that almost resembles a dance track. However, the song always returns to the refrain. It takes more than fucking someone you don't know to keep warm. You won't find love in a hole. This crude phrase of, uh, that both evokes the dark crevices of genitalia and the emotional hole the main character is in is both painful and comfortable and deeply cathartic. However, like normal, the song builds with sonic catharsis of staggering satisfaction. And Frightened Rabbit do, what Frightened Rabbit do in these moments is not anything aspirational, is that it tells you that you are not alone in feeling this way. And while you are with us, the players of the song who understand the terrible place you're in, take our hand and dance with us among people who refuse to judge you. These songs lean um, into my worst moments and tell me that someone somewhere cares or else why would we have made this song just for you? We know what you're going through because we captured it so well here. Have a hug and a pint and get fucked up and feel reinvigorated to take on life the next day, which is really something I need at the moment. These two tracks are the highlights for me on this record, but it's important to emphasize the quality of the rest of the album. Yes, any record with a modern letter, Keep Yourself Warm in My Backwards Walk, would be a 10 out of 10 immediately for me. But it's the quality of the rest of the record that makes it a classic, deservedly. Well said. Uh, that, what you said about Keep Yourself Warm, just... <sighs> Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. I'm really glad to hear that. Thank you. Well, you know, it's funny, Tyler, that you shared a story about your car. Because I had something similar happen to me this past week. When I worked my first overnight, I was going through their records again, just, you know, brushing up because I knew we had this episode. And by the time it, I had to leave, it was five in the morning. And I was almost all the way through um, the Midnight Organ fight. And I don't know if this happens with you all, or if this is just a me thing, or if it happens with people who listen to music frequently, is that whatever environment I listen to an album in last, it becomes inextricably tied to that environment until I listen to it again. Like when I think about re-listening to it, I think about being in my car at five in the morning, driving, anxious to get to sleep and the next time I listen to it wherever I'll be there will supersede that and it was odd just because I got to my memory of that right now is when I got to poke and I remember that I was on the road that turns into my subdivision when I heard the final four lines and I just keep replaying that over and over and over in my head and it's bizarre and I don't know how to explain why that happens or even whether or not like that stands to the quality of the album but that happens so vividly when I listen to all of these specifically these albums just because they evoke such an immediate emotional reaction that I feel hyper aware of my state of being and I guess I will get into my more proper writing on it. And <laughs> funny, I <laughs> the first sentence, I referenced something that Tyler actually just said. So that's perfect in a way. But I said, the Midnight Organ Fight once was once described by Tyler in our group chat as the ultimate breakup album. 
And considering <laughs> this, encompass, this encompasses the full range of emotion of being in that mindset, I really couldn't agree more. Midnight Organ Fight doesn't have the instrumental polish of every record that followed it, but its almost folk punk sensibilities are strong enough to make that lack of polish feel like a strength rather than a weakness. Even though it is a first outing, technically, it is utterly astonishing how good the songwriting on display here is. Is tons of my favorite Frightened Rabbit songs, and favorite songs in general, appear on this record. The album opener, The Modern Leper, is one of the best songs the band ever made, a song perfectly encapsulating the upbeat and, and anthemic tragicomedy they would develop on each record with both self-awareness and reflexiveness and emotional honesty that makes it worthy of both tears and self-critical laughter, displaying a fragility of a man whose organs would disappear in Scottish rain, introducing the kind of morbid body humor frequently brought up by the band uh, throughout their career. Uh, there's nothing remarkably ambitious on here like there is at least by the band's later standards but again I believe that's by design as the humility of the record grounds itself in a relatability that I would challenge any musically inclined person not to find themselves relating to. The upbeat I feel better is another kind of rager that's followed up by the even more impressively structured Good Arms versus Bad Arms, the distant, almost Americana-tinged guitars and acoustic chords in the front of the mix propel the song forward as Scott's clever lyrics like Good Arms versus Bad Arms, I'm going to win hands down, mask a soulful ballad about experiencing someone you loved move on without you, which struck a horribly relatable chord with me after experiencing not just one breakup last year, but two, specifically one that I was involved with for an entire year. Mm -hmm. And uh, so listening to it uh, kind of hurts. And that basically means that the song succeeds in spades. Fast Blood, the twist, and old, old fashioned assure you the album is just as likely to make you dance, even if you're in tears whilst you do so. Uh, trying to make the pain go away with the joy of an upbeat song about shedding your worries and anxieties away and trying to ignore the fact that you are mired in a cloud of misery that just won't go away. And sometimes it's at the expense of your own mental health. And this leads into Bright Bing Bookmark, which paired with Extra Super Very serve as spots on the album that I'm not 100% sold on. Both of these minute long and both of these are minute long and sort of barely serve as songs or interludes. And I just don't quite connect with them as, or really buy them as bridges between the songs that they are between. And they come up as just partially unnecessary, if still a development off of the ones that were on Sing the Grays. And they break up the momentum ever so slightly. But then again, it is only because I have listened to this so much that I even noticed this issue to begin with. And the issue itself is infinitesimally small. The three song run of Heads Roll Off, My Backwards Walk, and Keep Yourself Warm, or the album's emotional side hits you on full blast immediately and does not relent in the tone of the music or the tone of the lyrics. As we see a lot of Scott's ethos about coping mechanisms, adapting to the struggle of everyday life whilst battling with addiction and depression and other things Frightened Rabbit would come to be known for and arguably have perfected out of the gate with songs on this very album. Though, for me anyway, the back-to-back -back sequencing of Floating in the Fourth and Poke is the album's deepest and darkest moment. Floating in the Fourth being a song that features a now harrowing depiction of loneliness and abandonment, and going back to it now with the context that we have, hearing Scott's forlorn cries of I think I'll save suicide for another day do nothing short of absolutely ruin me. Leading into the forlorn closer of Who'd You Kill Now, which features Scott sorrowfully asking himself, who he pushed down the stairs last night, which I always see as a sort of moment of realization where you awaken from a drunken stupor that you got into because of a heartbreak, said stupor being the songs on the album that are up-tempo and lively, and the song now, the realization of your regret at the drunken actions that you took the night before. It perfectly captures that feeling, that experience, in a beautiful and near-transcendent way. This took a while to properly grow on me, 
and Scott's very, very thick accent and boyish vocals might take some getting used to if this is your introduction to the band. But the Midnight Organ Fight remains an astonishing feat in songwriting and one of the Frightened Rabbit albums I have come back to the most. Beautifully well said. That was, that yeah. was lovely. Uh, um, I'll also shout out the um, the bonus tracks as well. I'll do this for each yes. that we talk about as well. Whether um, people have heard them or not, I'll just shout them out very briefly. Um, yeah. So the, bon- the the actually the version of Midnight Organ Fight I've always known has always had them on it. Even though I mm. think that... Um, I think in terms of like bonus tracks and B-sides, I actually prefer the B-sides and bonus tracks. It's basically every other album, though these are still good. Um, Don't mm. is a really kind of like gently sad and folky um, and uh, it has this very uplifting vocal in it. Uh, Soon Go is a kind of um, trenchant and and heavy into the album. I actually like it um, even more as a closer than Who Do You Kill Now? Um, uh, and then there's also a cover of British pop group N Trance's song Set You Free, uh, which I don't really care for, to be perfectly honest, but it's still fine. Um, so yeah, uh, it, it goes without saying that if you're a fan of any of these albums, it's worth checking out uh, songs that were released on singles as B-sides or bonus tracks, because they're all pretty damn good. But yeah, Midnight Organ Fight, stellar album. Um, yep. Yeah, I think we all said it pretty damn well. Yeah, it's... So let's, yeah. uh, okay. let's move into our favorite tracks and ratings then. Yes. Um, I can go first this time if you want. Yeah, I, I, I am going to suggest reverse chance and T-order for this, if that's okay. Sure. <laughs> uh, so my... <sighs> stupid question. My favorite <laughs> tracks. Uh, so I'll say Poke, uh, Modern Leper, and My Backwards Walk. Uh, least favorite track is Who Do You Kill Now? Uh, and I'm going to give this album a 10 out of 10. Okay. My favorite tracks are My Backwards Walk, Keep Yourself Warm, and The Modern Leper. Basic bitch choices, I know. But um, yeah, my least favorite... Good. It's true. My least favorite track doesn't exist. Um, and I'm giving this record a 10 out of 10. Good stuff. Well, uh, my three favorite tracks, which, again very difficult are in order i guess the modern leper um good arms versus bad arms and uh poke mm-hmm. and my least favorite is one of the two interludes probably um extra super very uh, if i had to pick between the two of them and i give the album a 9.5 mm. cool good stuff mm. uh, yeah so some context at this point uh i'll let someone else do their review of the next album first but i want to give some context mm. um so uh midnight organ fight was a in terms of the indie scene it was a pretty strong success uh it was immediately lauded um immediately beloved uh, gained the band a lot of attention and a lot of fans um and so there was a lot of uh, eagerness to see where they would go next with their sound um so following uh, this album, guitarist Andy Monaghan joined the band initially to assist with live performances of the album, but he became a permanent member who had uh, very important musical contributions to all their subsequent albums. Uh, in 2009, a live album was released featuring a performance of the entirety of Midnight Organ Fight. Uh, that live album is called Liver, Lung, FR. Um, it's fine. Uh, it's certainly not a bad live album, though I will say I do think that pretty much all the studio versions are better. Um, but if you're a completist, it's still like you're not going to you know, be bored or anything. It's the Midnight Organ Fight. Um, in 2009, uh, another guitarist, Gordon Skeen, also joined the band. Uh, and in 2010, they released The Winter of Mixed Drinks their third album, and also the second produced by Peter Catus. So they reunited with the same producer as the previous record for this one. Uh, It's worth adding that this album was a conscious effort to make their sound more maximal, larger than life, and themic than the previous record had been, and also to experiment with denser and heavier mixes generally. Um, So who who would like to talk about their feelings about this record first? 
Um, I, my review is short, and I need to get more tea, so I'm just going to read this and then and then go do okay, that. Cool. cool. Um, I mean, short, short compared to the last one. Um, so, Winter Mixed Drinks. This album title comes from a line in the song Living in Colour, with Hutchison stating, um, I think we've all had odd, lonely fellow periods in life where you find yourself detached from everything, drifting and lost. And that's what the title means to me. But most importantly, it's the moments of joy afterwards during your recovery that defines the dark period, which really accurately describes the appeal of this album. Uh, mixed drinks to me implies mixed varieties of intoxication or mixed fortunes and of stumbling through life because you shouldn't have had those vodka, co- those vodka cocktails after the pre-drinks of lager, should you? Um, <laughs> yes, this is <laughs> the winter mixed drinks, but the thing about the seasons is that they pass cyclically. The existence of winter implies a coming summer to return to a previous theme. Um, now, this album to me isn't as good as Midnight Talk and Fight, um, which isn't a criticism per se, because honestly, what is as good as Midnight Talk and Fight? Um, in, this, in the case of this record, though, uh, I would say the two by two knockout, sort of keep yourself warm, my backwards walk equivalent um, are the first two tracks Things and Swim to Can't See Land. Um, while this album incorporates more fleshed out experimental mixing, Um, and the beginning of what would be an increased fascination with um, a post-punk influence. Um, uh, um, Here we see the atmosphere take on a renewed importance to the appeal. appeal. For example, on Things, um, on the first chorus, you have this constant bass drum pumping it forward behind the scenes. And the chorus is absolutely drenched in reverb. Um, And there's the lyrics of Things, a song that takes a sort of moving on and out as a metaphor for leaving behind the toxic parts of your past life, and quite a literal metaphor. Um, As someone who in the last four years, get this, has moved seven times, about to be eight, I do indeed relate to this. Um, (laughs) These things hardly show that I have lived. Um, And then Swim Until You Can't See Land, one of my all-time favorite Frightened Rabbit songs, one of their all-time best. The song just evokes a presence of mind and a sense of internal peace and harmony in me that I, that I just can't explain. Um, this song works on the ambiguity inherent on leaving the past behind you. Are you moving on or running? Um, and can you ever know the difference? This is a euphoric song, especially with the repetition of the refrain towards the end of the song as the instrument, instruments get to their most anarchic, are you a man or a bag of sand? This line epitomizes the theme of the song, the beauty in just trying and pushing forward. The, the bag of sand is the useless, enable thing, constantly manipulated and pushed around and used by the world around it. Just a base thing, containing an airless, bland thing such as sand. And the man is the one who actively tries to push forward. This is picked up again on the album's haunting interlude slash reprieve, man, bag of sand. Um, this is what I mean by the fact that the, this song finds beauty in just moving on. It does, does it matter if you're moving on or running? You, you are making a choice that in the moment feels like it's a self-improvement. That makes you human. Um, other highlights include Skip the Youth, which builds through a two-minute instrumental before vocals come in, building on already beautiful lyrics, so an outro that is up there with the most euphoric ecstatic moments the band has ever produced. Um, Nothing Like You brings energy to the album and picks up the pace of the record, um, and Not Miserable gives me life, repeated outro lines of I'm not miserable now. Uh, Living in Colour is a beautiful, hopeful, and aching love song, and Yes, I Would is a perfect closer. Um, this is maybe not as consistently perfect as Midnight Organ Fight. This is a very deserving successor, um, nearly reaching the same heights and pushing the sound, the sound of the band forward in exciting ways. Beautiful. Thank you. Love to see it. Jake, do you want to do you want to tell us? Yeah. Some well, let's see here. <sighs> The winter of mixed drinks is, in essence, the start of a progression I see in a vague narrative that underlies these three of these records starting here. The midnight organ fight is a drunken night out of partying and then the ultimate realization of not being able to escape the things that led you there, but the winter of mixed drinks is about coping with the things that you cannot escape. 
It opens with Things, notable for being Scott's favorite song, a song about being worth more than the sum of your possessions and the associated memories with those possessions. It's sad, sorrowful even, full of regret, but almost of disdain, of eagerness to push past it all. It feeds into the momentum of the record too, and the album does not let go of that until it ends. This is perfectly embodied by the never stop moving forward anthem of Swim Until You Can't See Land, an almost overwhelmingly optimistic track about pushing through everything that holds you back and swimming forward despite it all, even if it means drowning or not making it in the end. The first real moment of confronting darkness is in the loneliness, where Scott's desire to be seen, to be heard, to be understood by others, his trademark yearning for someone else rears its head, but in a decidedly more triumphant way. Combating loneliness seems to be at the heart of all of Frightened Rabbit's music, so this has instantly became a, a very quintessential song for me. A song about validating your own existence and the sheer primal desire to share that validation with someone else. The record stretches on into songs that are about this swim until you can't see land mentality, the overall mission statement of the album which is even reprised onto the brief track Man Slash Bag of Sand, which shows to me at least a distinct growth in how Scott is using his track list and shorter songs to the album's benefit. Foot Shooter is a remarkable song about a struggle with alcoholism and depression and how it feels like a self-fulfilling prophecy of shooting yourself in the foot over and over again, refusing to learn. But Scott's resolve as a whole and attitude in general is not about learning to stop shooting himself in the foot, but to keep on walking despite the fact that his foot is bleeding. Segwaying into Not Miserable shows a genuine upturn of Scott looking back on his past self and seeing genuine improvement. The opening line literally being, it's easier now, as he looks back with a newfound wisdom. And even though things aren't perfect, he's still not where he used to be, which is its own reward. And it's not the last time we'll see Scott using his age to ponder back on things that were that once were. The triumphant living in color continues this theme as things literally get less gray for Scott personally, as this song refers to several past lyrics from other albums and clever allusions. The final track, the absolutely outstanding Yes I Would, culminates with everything Scott's referenced so far, very subtly, talking about his issues with codependency, referencing his loneliness, and calling himself a hemophiliac, hearkening back to the body fragility from Midnight Organ Fight, but also saying that his wounds will scab over, implying healing in progress. The production on the record is more full sounding, more diverse, and more eloquent than the previous outing, showing how the band grew musically, but also reflecting a well-realized version of the self. It's a record about stubborn, hard-boiled perseverance, and feels like a personal progression from Midnight Organ Fight, giving the impression that Scott was perhaps in the midst of an upswing. And regardless of that statement's truth or mistruth, its perception is undeniable in the album's distinctly more optimistic yet still down-to-earth attitude. It is an album dedicated to keeping you warm when all you feel is bitter cold. It tells you to swim until you can't see land. And honestly, I really can't think of a better summary of this band as a whole than that simple line. Beautiful. Well said. Yeah, I totally concur. I think this is the most uplifting uh, record we're going to talk about today. Yep. Um, and it's a beautiful kind of counterpoint to the relentless darkness of, of Midnight Organ Fight. It's a good um, casual one to put on if you want to listen to this music without being like overwhelmed. Yeah. That said, I do think. Um, there's a fair amount of darkness in this record, perhaps totally. more more than than uh, you were associated maybe see. Um, yeah, it's so as I've said, this, the 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 kind of mixes are denser and heavier, and there's more going on sonically. I mean, I'm sure that's due at least in part to the addition of two new guitarists to the band. Um, but yeah, it's immediately apparent from the heavy distorting opening to things. Uh, which, as you've pointed out, Jake, uh, Scott has said, I believe he said shortly before his death, actually, that, that it was oh. his favorite song that he had written. And it's certainly one of the most triumphant, uh, a Scott sounding renewed and revived from the depressive stupor of, of the previous record, shedding his possessions to embrace an existence where he's bound to no one and to nothing. 
It's a true, absolute freedom in the most profound and total sense. Uh, it's my favorite opening, actually, to any of their albums. Uh, it's, it's a great a, one. It's a truly larger than life beginning to a unique and ambitious record. Uh, lead single, Swim Until You Can't See Land, uh, as both of you have talked about, it's one of the most insistently catchy songs the band ever wrote, uh, with that titular earworm chorus being just ridiculously addictive. Uh, it also introduces a water theme that carries across the yep. record, and of course, Harold's back to floating in the fourth, and Scott's career-long interest in the sea, and all that it can uh, metaphorically and physically represent the sea as an escape. Uh, as something tranquil and forgiving, or as a violent and unforgiving barrier between one realm and the next, as in lines like, I salute at the threshold of the North Sea of my mind, and I nod to the boredom that drove me here to face the tide. That ultimately Scott was drawn to the sea uh, as his final resting place, or it seems, uh, is of course the bitter thorn that makes this regular writer's focus uncomfortably grim and poignant. Uh, Scott alludes to his preoccupation with the idea of surrendering himself to the ocean and lines like, let's call me a Baptist, let's call this a drowning of the past, and the sea has seen my like before, though it's my first and perhaps last time. Uh, it is a true testament to Scott and the band's musical talent that they're able to render a topic as difficult as planning one's own suicide through the lens of a cheery major key pop song without that incongruity feeling off-putting or trite. Um, the Loneliness in the Scream, another single, uh, brings the record's anthemic qualities to the fore in a big way with this huge, chanted, wordless, millennial whoop style chorus employed to Im surprisingly emotional effect and it's honestly one of their most uplifting songs. It casts screaming as a means of catharsis and emotional cleansing. The loneliness and the scream to prove to everyone that I exist is simply one of the most effectively concise sentiments of pain that Scott ever wrote. Uh, I think The Wrestle is a supremely underrated Frightened Rabbit song that revisits some of the same themes of the previous album's Fast Blood examining sex and more broadly human desire through the lens of animalistic and primal metaphors, specifically that of battling with a shark at sea uh, in lines like the shape stirs beneath me, a pulse pounds along bloodstreams, the first bite marks the beginning of the clothless wrestle with the clothless animal. I enjoy the analysis that someone wrote of this song on Genius so much that I'm just going to quote it directly. Quote, he feels he must endure this struggle in order to reach manhood, but he entirely fails. The song's continual anguish implies that he fails because he is too focused on achieving some sort of violent triumph over his fears, rather than any sort of real pleasure, his own or his lover's. Unquote. Just a fantastic song. Uh, Skip the Youth begins curiously with an extended two-minute introduction of building, noisy, distorted guitar layering and drums, simulating a rising tension and an anxiety that I think is intended to represent the gradual increase of these feelings of turmoil as Scott ages from a young child to a young adult, something the rest of the song expands on lyrically. All the hammer and scrape has been chipping away at the luster of life, he sings, Later assuring himself, if you don't stare at the dark, if you never feel bleak, life starts to lose its taste. The bridge of the song alludes to drums as representing the worn out beat of a tired heart, a lyrical motif Scott will return to on Painting of a Panic Attack. Ultimately, the song rises into a frenzy of musical layering as Scott sings, skip the youth, it's aging me too much. Nothing Like You gloriously recasts the post-breakup depression of Midnight Organ Fight to a more optimistic, gleeful, fuck you lens. This is a story and you're not in it. Flock of pages torn out. 
here's a bedroom and you've never been in it. Here's your shovel, here's the ground. I have seen some people read this song through a more negative lens as a delusion of progression in the mind of someone still lingering on the past, but I disagree entirely. To me, this is pure cathartic progression. Scott has found someone new that he is genuinely happy with, conceding that all my questions still ask for answers, but that I can put us to bed tonight. And most importantly, as the title expresses, that he has truly found a way forward because the new person he is with is nothing like you. Not a replacement, not a temporary substitute, but something new. Foot Shooter is one of my favorite Frightened Rabbit songs, full stop. A glorious, well-written capturing of the experience of being horribly drunk and embarrassing yourself. A super intensely relatable song. Uh, it has one of their absolute best choruses ever that on the page does not read as catchy, but that Scott just absolutely carries with an irresistible vocal melody and an energetic performance, painting a scene in which the words he hurls have physical violence. Duck under that desk, cover your neck, thicken your skin as I begin to shoot myself in the foot again. And that horrific feeling of the aftermath, waking up in the morning after and realizing what happened is captured beautifully in the second verse. In the stark and sobering dry sunlight, I will blink my eyes and hope the blink can erase all the shit that I said and did. Not Miserable is a sonically unique track, basically entirely exist consisting of a cresting instrumental build with drums that don't even come in until the final quarter of the song, and a heavy focus on ambient atmosphere and emotional intensity conveyed almost entirely through vocals, both those of Scott and the primary singing and the ringing background voices supporting him. I have a slightly different and more darker interpretation of this song. Um, to me, the song is Scott musing on his death from the perspective of now being on the other side, reassuring his loved ones that he's no longer suffering. Uh, I'm not miserable now, he intones repeatedly, like a mantra, admitting with some pain that no one knows this. And sing it anyway, as, if though, as though if he sings it hard enough, it might get through um, to the world of the living. He even refers to his previous music in the lines, so the hymns that I sung, Prayers for the fucked from a bitter, forked tongue. Sing of history now. I realize this is a bit of a morbid interpretation of the song, but it's just the way that it's always kind of felt to me. It's, given it's me a, a lot very of, valid one. I'm it's not, given I'm me a lot of you're... catharsis. And I love, I love that you have, um, that to me, that to you it represents something more positive as well, because I love that depth and, and dimensionality to it. That's, I'm sure, entirely purposeful in the way that it's written. Um, but yeah, just a God, God, foot shooter and not miserable back to back. Just save me. Yep. Uh, Living in Color reanimates the album gloriously with a slice of vaguely Celtic and themic folk rock, a ridiculously catchy chorus, and some of the most life affirming lyrics that Scott ever wrote, an extension of the theme of nothing like you, finding passion and fulfillment in the vitality of another person. Yes, I would is probably their most underrated closing track, uh, an incredibly moving plea to some other, even to himself or to the darkness inside him, to give him another chance to redeem himself and to live his life better, or to try and erase his mistakes, or just to be allowed to live inside the color described in the previous track for just a little bit longer. Well, what if I had never thrown that bone? What if this tear in my side just pours and pours and pours? I wonder if they'd notice that I'm not around. The loss of a lonely man never makes much of a sound. Scott's vocals at the end of the song, calling out to himself, would I change if you carried me back? Yes, I would. Believe me now. I just can't sink now. Yes, I would. The preoccupation with drifting into the sea to die explored earlier in the record is refuted with the fire forged by new fulfillment as Scott hollers to the sea that he is not ready, not yet, not today. 
It's a similar sentiment to me as expressed in Floating in the Fourth, yet here it feels even more hopeful, more defiant, more sure than just the I think of that song. It's a beautiful end to the record. Uh, yeah, I adore this album so much. Uh, shout out as well to um, the one particular B-side on this record, Fun Stuff, which is uh, one of my favorite Frightened Rabbit songs generally. It's a very um, low-key uh, and stripped-back song, uh, but it's just overwhelmingly emotional. Like, I it's hard for me not to bawl my eyes out when I listen to it, even though it's super simple and, and definitely easy to see why it's not on this record. Highly recommend checking that one out. Um, but yeah, this is such a good album. Um, I adore it. I feel it gets a little bit neglected. Um, and I think that's a little bit unfair because there's so much good stuff here. Um, yeah. Awesome. Mm -hmm. I love this album. It's great. Yeah. Cool. Uh, all right, well, let's move into our favorite tracks then. Um, Jake, do you want to go first this time? Yeah, sure. Um, three favorite tracks are Not Miserable, Yes, I Would, and Swim Until You Can't See Land. Those are not the only three that will be on my list at the end because this album is good with a capital G. And uh, like before, or well, unlike before, uh, no, no least favorite track, none. This gets a 10. Fuck yes, it does. Fuck yes, it does. Mm, let's go. So let's go and jump into your order, then. Let's fucking uh, go. <laughs> yeah. Frightened rabbit. No <laughs> shit. I am scared bunny. Um, <laughs> so my three are probably things so until you can't see land. Um, actually, no, not things so until you can't see land. Skip the youth and not miserable. Ha. Um. <gasps> don't have least favorite and i'm giving this record a nine out of ten good stuff Woo! my three favorites are things foot shooter and yes i would my least favorite if i had to pick one although i don't really want to but i had to pick one uh i'll pick the interlude man bag of sand uh and this album fuck it it gets a 10 from me boy. let's go Good we need to. We, we should relish this while we have it. Mm -hmm. Oh mm -hmm. yes, yes. This is the like as I said. It's it's the most uplifting record we're going to talk about today. Yep. Um, <laughs> and so, on that note, pedestrian <laughs> verse. Well, oh, a little no. bit of context as well between regular oh, context. No. So, so um, after this, mm -hmm. so this album was released uh, in early 2010. Uh, in 2011, the band released the Ah Frightened Rabbit EP which has three songs on it, uh, Scottish Winds, The Work, and Fuck This Place. Uh, Scottish <laughs> Winds and The Work are pretty good songs. In fact, I like them quite a bit. But Fuck This Place is just a masterpiece. One of the most emotional and unconventional songs ever released under the Frightened Rabbit label. Uh, I remember vividly, I did not discover that this EP and by extension this song existed until actually after um, Scott died. Uh, for some reason, these three songs just completely um, blew past me. But I just remember I was sitting in this exact spot the first time I heard Fuck This Place. And I cried so hard. I just just lost it. I couldn't contain myself. Uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful song. And I can't recommend it strongly enough. Uh, so yeah, that EP came out in 2011. Uh, and ahead of their next record, they also released uh, the State Hospital EP, which featured that song and a few other songs uh, that were B-sides from Pedestrian Verse. And also following Pedestrian Verse, I'll also shout out uh, my favorite EP um, that Frightened Rabbit released, which is the Woodpile EP, which has obviously the Woodpile on it, but also three fantastic B-sides that I want to shout out, which are uh, Default Blues, Candlelit, and Radio Silence. Uh, if you haven't heard those uh, and you're a fan of pedestrian verse, then it's like more pedestrian verse and it's just as good. Um, yeah. So shout out to those EPs and side project or not side projects, but shout out to those EPs. Um, their fourth album pedestrian verse was released in February, February, 2013. Um, and um. <laughs> Oh, so I'll give a little bit of context like I did about production here. Um, so 
Yeah, 2013, the band emerged newly focused and with a cleaner and more polished sound than they had ever had before. This album is produced by Leo Abrahams, who has produced for Imogen Heap, Brian Eno, Regina Spector, and Paul Simon, among others. So they have a great sense of being able to get fantastic producers. Um, this new sound, I guess I'll just do my review. Fuck it. This new sound is just is cavernous, larger than life. It captures the musical diversity of an album like Winter, but through more spacious mixes that have lots of room to breathe and, and make the songs poised for mainstream success. Even though the band didn't quite achieve mainstream success with any of these songs, they all still display the band's most finely tuned, sophisticated, and elaborate arrangements yet. With his writing as well, Scott turns his lens outward, uh, with a focus more on eliciting universal or moving sentiments about humanity through the stories of others as much as himself, utilizing an ostensibly fictional lens and more often third person pronouns than the earlier records predominantly first and second person writing. Uh, all of these new aspects of their sound and songwriting focus are evident from opening track Acts of Man, which leads off with a piano melody in an unusual time signature, and Scott painting a portrait of scenes in which heroic acts of man are nowhere to be found. It was intended by Scott to be the male-focused counterpoint to State Hospital's story of female suffering, which we'll get to. And the two songs are kind of tethered through this framework. Uh, Scott displays an almost misanthropic disgust at the men of the world around him. And it's captured effectively in writing such as, I see the stumbling pinstriped trouser, flecks of sick on an office shoe part of the fatty British average that lives in the houses around you. And, and also, while the knight in shitty armor rips a drunk out of her dress, one man tears into another, hides a coward's heart in a lion's chest. Scott eventually does turn the lens inward, both in the song's witty and disarming opening line. I am that dickhead in the kitchen giving wine to your best girl's glass. And at the humbled conclusion to the song, I am just like all the rest of them, sorry, selfish, trying to improve. It's a fantastic and surprisingly layered song from a fantastic songwriter. Uh, I won't hear a bad word about it. Not that I think I'm going to, but it's, it's awesome. I love that. I love it as an opener. Um, the album's energy roars to life with second song Backyard Skulls, which has the band sounding renewed, impassioned, energetic, perhaps in part due to the addition of guitarist Gordon Skeen and a generally more collaborative approach to the musicianship on this album. The song is an expansion of a theme that actually Sufjan Stevens famously explored on the Illinois track John Wayne Gacy Jr., in which he compared himself to the serial killer and warned listeners to look under the floorboards for the secrets I have hid. Here in Watch our episode of Sufjan Stevens for more of that content. <laughs> yes, please do. Here in Backyard Skulls, secrets are bodies in shallow graves, white silent skulls smiling at the hypocrisy of a middle-class delusional existence. Yet more energy is found in the blistering screed of holy, which targets not so much religion as the self-righteousness of many of its preachers in Scott's experience. The holy slash full of holes wordplay is perhaps a little on the nose, but Scott makes it work through sheer passion and grit. And it's difficult not to feel a bolt of cathartic joy when stop uh, stop being stop uh, being holy because you know I'm full of holes eventually becomes I'll never be holy thank god I'm full of holes at the song's roaring climax uh, the woodpile was described by Scott as a big confident rock song about helplessness and it does scan as one of their most anthemic purely enjoyable and massive sounding tracks Listen to the way the music drops out and then comes in again as Scott shouts, I'm trapped in a collapsing building, the foundations erupting around him as he relies on another to bring a spark to his snapped limb in an unlit pyre. 
Listen to the song's instrumental bridge and the way the guitars come in again as a heavy bedrock of beneath a scrawling solo before the vocals themselves, first chilling background calls, and then Scott himself roar into the song, effectively setting it alight in a way that mirrors the lyrical subject matter. It's one of the most purely thrilling and exciting musical moments in their entire discography, and I love it to bits, and it's always going to be one of those songs that I just blitz down the road and just holler at the top of my lungs because it just makes me feel so full. I love it. Uh, Late March, Death March revisits the Catholic upbringing that coloured holy, with Scott addressing many of the lyrics here to Christ himself, even as he winkingly admits, there isn't a God, so I'll save my breath. The song essentially captures the feeling of throwing yourself into a meaningless existence of distractions and sin, and the hypocrisies of the ways we attempt to rationalise our pain and suffering through a spiritual lens. As we walk through an hour-long pregnant pause, no grain of truce can be born. My bridge is burned and perhaps we'll shortly learn that it was arson all along. December's Traditions, a song that I underrated for a long time, is a move, moving and urgent song about the failure of Scottish society to take mental illness seriously leaving people like Scott in the lurch and having to justify and prove their own pain, ultimately left behind by all those with anything resembling power to create a more supportive world. There is real pain in the repetition of what do you need from me? And lines like the ghostly body that sleeps beside you is slowly losing teeth, paint a grim and vivid picture using startling imagery. There's some of that body horror imagery that Jake, you've alluded to in the past coming to light there in that line. Following the interstitial housing in the track dead now provides a grim aftermath to December's traditions warning. I'm dead now, check my chest and you'll see the life has been mined from me, burned for the heat. Scott's writing eventually gradually becomes more unhinged and desperate across the song in lines like, we'll scream hell towards heaven's door and I'll piss on your front porch. And then the twisting of the chorus to, we're all dead now, join hands and we'll sing to the glory of hell and the virtue of sin. Eventually, he collapses into one of the most pure and bluntly direct sentiments expressed on the entire album. There is something wrong with me. Y'all know where we're at now. Yeah. I'm, That's I'm, what I'm, we've been waiting for. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of regretting going first just because like, I'm going to say a lot now. And it, yeah. Well, look, it's probably best that we don't make anything you have to say redundant. Like, let's make it a holistic thing. Okay, cool. I just leaped into it because I just wanted to talk about the song so badly. So, State Hospital. Yeah. To, yeah. State Hospital is my favorite song of all time. You Good know choice. that. Our listeners probably don't, but I'm saying it. Mm -hmm. It's my favorite song of all time, uh, ever, across everything. Um, not only does it perfectly distill the record's themes and interest in pain on a universal scale through a strictly humanist lens, but with an equal interest in the social and societal implications, and even the political, that all contribute to preventable human suffering. It also feels like the definitive Frightened Rabbit song which is not the last time I'm going to say that, funnily <laughs> enough. Um, the definitive expression of Scott's own pain, though channeled through the fictional story of a suicidal young girl burdened by an abusive family and a neglectful world. The opening lyric, the half backflip conception, state hospital birth, displays Scott's interest in capturing sex again as this ugly, violent act that in this instance bears something destined for pain and suffering. The most threadbare, tall story the country's ever heard, being a line that sardonically captures the grim normality of life as an unbearable pain people are born into without choice. 
The next lines make it clear that the girl's home environment is violent and hateful, with the rape her mother experiences at the hands of her father, referred to as the national weight. Alluding to the phrase, lie back and think of England, used to justify sexual exploitation, and also drawing another link between interpersonal violence and Britain's national identity. The chorus has among the most devastating lines Scott has ever written. Her heart beats like a breeze block thrown down the stairs. Her blood is thicker than concrete. Forced to be brave, she was born into a grave. The second verse paints an equally grim social picture. In the limp through years of board schooling, she's accustomed to hearing that she could never run far. A slipped disc in the spine of community, a bloody curse word in a pedestrian verse, spirits in graveyards and fingers in car parks, she cries in the high street just to be heard, a screaming anchor for nothing in particular at the fruit of the fuck of it, dragging her heels in the dirt. I mean, these are just some of the most moving lyrics I've ever heard. And if you can't find a resonance in them on face value alone, I don't know what to tell you. I mean, I, c I can't begin to pick apart how intensely emotionally affecting I find the line, a screaming anchor for nothing in particular. So much so that I would gladly have it be my epitaph. Even as the character in the song encounters someone else longing for human connection, her heart continues to beat like a cinder block, nervous and uncertain and completely without knowledge of how to trust and how to move forward. What Scott understands here, that many posturing artists do not, is that for someone who has lived a life of constant suffering, the possibility of true, kind human connection based on a mutual need is not attractive. It is terrifying. It is something you shy away from because any possibility of happiness that might be hinted at can only be seen as another potential disappointment, another potential heartbreak, another stab into the already gaping, festering wound. But, but, Scott's true masterstroke with the conclusion of this song is to help us to understand this, while also teaching us that the possibility of better, the possibility of genuine goodness, is still not mutually exclusive from this mindset of constant fear. The song does not end with some kind of trite learning to love or happy ending simply the open possibility for better. That through the terror, as much as there is the possibility it will lead to more heartbreak, there is the chance equally that it will not, that the pain might be able to lessen, even if it will never be gone entirely. That even if we will be too fearful to fully love others, we might one day be able to love ourselves. Four simple words that contain all of this, without preaching to us, without guarantees. Just a chance. That's all that has to be. All is not lost. So it's beautiful. <sighs> You're not even done the album yet! Fuck! <laughs> You're doing great. Nitrous gas! is a beautiful oh, dirge uh, that brings things back to the realm of the personal. And it remains one of Scott's most moving meditations on his own experience of a hollowing lifetime depression. It is Scott's attempt to render the age-old expression that I wish I was dead through his bluntly poetic lens, expressing that exact sentiment in a number of equally devastating but beautifully imagistic ways. Throw up the sickly joy and I'll swallow the sweet self-loathing. 
suck in the bright red major keys, spit out the blue minor misery. And the titular sentiment, if happiness won't come to me, hand me the nitrous gas. If happiness won't live with me, I think I can live with that. A bitter expression uh, that the closest to true contentment that Scott believes he can feel is a fake, chemically forced laughter that could hopefully kill him in a large enough dose. It's a very simple, minimal and straightforward song. It's very pared back, but I adore it and I find it to be one of the most elementally relatable that he ever wrote. And then final track, The Oil Slack. Uh, I presume at least one of you is going to speak on this one at length, so I'm not going to linger on it too long. It's pure classic Frightened Rabbit. It's one of their most beloved and musically interesting and lyrically striking pieces. Uh, here, Scott's sense of worthlessness, of self-loathing, and even animosity toward his own art are captured through the metaphor of all of his expression being a plague of oil, trapping and torturing everything and everyone within its grasp. However, as with State Hospital, there is a glimmer of possibility for things to be better, for there to be genuine worth and warmth in such a life, bursting through the final lines, even as darkness remains ever present. There is a light, but there is a tunnel to crawl through. There is love, but its misery loves you. Still got hope, so I think we'll be fine in these disastrous times. Yeah. Um, so yeah, this is my favorite Frightened Rabbit album. I think. A good I'm not. Pick. I'm not sure. I say that, and I'm not <laughs> sure. I don't know. Maybe. It's very hard for there to be a bad pick. I don't know. Like, there's no album you can say to me except for the first one. This is my favorite Frightened Rabbit record. They'll be like, "Yeah, you're talking out your ass." Yeah. Uh, yeah. <sighs> Probably gonna eat those words when we talk about painting in a minute. But whatever. Um, I want to shout out as well, before I surrender the mic to you all, I want to shout out the bonus tracks on this uh, album, which I think are the best bonus tracks of any of their record, um, though the painting ones are good as well, and we'll talk about those too. But I really love the bonus tracks here. If You Were Me, Snow Still Melting, and Escape Route, uh, three phenomenal songs. Like, you had those songs, and also the songs I alluded to on the Woodpile EP and the State Hospital EP. This time was an incredibly prolific recording session for the band. A lot of material came out of preparing for pedestrian births, and it's staggering how good all of it is. Um, so I can't encourage digging into the B-sides enough. But yeah, um, pedestrian verse. Why is this not heralded by everyone as an indie rock classic? Explain that to me. I don't get it. I don't get why hey. people slept on this. It's so like it's so perfectly tuned to be loved by people. Yeah, exactly. Like it just like there's not like a reason as to wish like there's not like a point where like oh I really love this but but I get why other people wouldn't. It's like no, I don't get why other people wouldn't. This doesn't make sense. Like I mean just the the run of energy from backyard skulls to late march death march the the pure propulsiveness of that run like how can you not just be swept up in that i don't get it they also uh shout out as well they hadn't up to this point i don't think oh there were a few there were music videos for swim until you can't see land loneliness in the screen uh on the previous record but um they did more music videos on pedestrian verse there were music videos for backyard skulls holy the Woodpile, uh, State Hospital. Yeah, those songs all have music videos. They're all fantastic. Go and watch the music videos if you haven't. They're really funny. Well, some of them are funny. Some of them are dark. Um, they're all beautiful. Um, the Woodpile video especially uh, is hilariously, uh, is a hilarious kind of contrast to the song. Very darkly funny. Um, uh, and the State Hospital is just pure misery. Don't watch that video if you don't, if you're not sensitive to that. If you are sensitive As to as if the song isn't already. Yeah, 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 definitely. Um, but yeah, I want to. Sh- I, I I did mean to shout out their music videos because they're all really good. Um, mm. And yeah. So anyway, uh, someone else can talk about this album now. Do you want to have a go, Jack? Do you want to do it? I'm either way, honestly. Yeah. Why don't Why don't you go, Jake? I want to. I want to hear from okay. from you on this one. Not that I don't want to hear from Sosha as well, but I... Um, no, no, it's fine. It's I, just uh, my notes and my thoughts are much more sporadic, so I want Jake to get his thoughts out. 
Cool. Yeah, sure. Um, well, I mean, I won't dance around it. I think that Pedestrian Verse is quite arguably the band and by extension Scott's greatest achievement. After the personal upswing of winter where we saw Scott internally progress forward, we now see him project this growth outward, taking the role more of a narrative storyteller. He's no less involved or invested in these songs and stories, but they are notably for the most part stories and stories of and about people who all reflect Scott instead of him instead of himself or whatever he wants to talk about. In songs like Holy, Housing, and State Hospital, there are direct allusions to fictional characters that we learn about. And Scott's lyricism from past records suits the narrator position very well, as it allows for a broader range of subject matter. But a personal touch in that guarantees the sense of investment in the people that he's talking about. This isn't from a distance or anything. Primarily on the record standout song, State Hospital, which weaves a heartbreaking tale of a fragile young girl born with disabilities into a terrible home who is su suffering from sexual violence, that you would, and all of these things would make it impossible for her to live a normal life or really to live at all, as it says she is born into a grave. But her perseverance in the mere act of living and ability to survive past this makes her not only a walking testament to Scott's swim until you can't see land mantra from the last record, but an inspiration on a national scale connecting the whole world and by extension the audience. And it feels like a mission statement for the band and this album as a whole, not to mention Scott's utterly triumphant and equally heart-wrenching final lines to the song, All Is Not Lost, which regardless of context, is captivating to hear him say now. And that's not to say this record is devoid of the more traditionally forward-moving songs or personal songs. Perhaps my other favorite on the album, Late March, Death March, is absolutely astounding. It's fist-pumping, anthemic banger that makes me want to push through whatever it is I'm doing or struggling with and come out on the other side, which shows you just why this record is so fucking special. It instills in you the same feeling as other Frightened Rabbit records, even stronger in some instances, but does so by different, more creative, more narratively ambitious means. And songs like Oil Slick come along at the end that still assure you that Scott's presence is still personally felt, as this upbeat sounding song details what it feels like to be in his shoes speaking as if Oil Slick coats his every word and these little details that you can uncover personally about Scott are hidden everywhere. I think this record is ambitious. I think that it is just as heartfelt and personal as the others, and like Tyler, I am mystified as to its lack of popularity or recognition as I think this should be heralded as a modern classic, and writing-wise is as good as any literature or poetry that is likely to exist out there. I find it to be sprawling, but not spread too thin. It is the perfect amount of given details, but also being able to tell the audience just enough, but not too much to paint sort of an abstract or impressionist painting in their head of what's going on here. And these vivid portraits are something that recurs, I think, in the album's track list is like, it just so easily brings to mind an image. It's like, it's almost like when I'm listening to an Autekker album and I try to picture up a specific scene and to what's happening with the, with the, the music going on there. And I think the fact that this is music and the lyrics makes it more impressive even just because it's there, there's more to go on, I believe. And there's more to, that can be lost in translation, but nothing is lost in any regard here. I think there are moments of uplifting parts that, like it's a perfect mix of Midnight Organ Fight and Winter of Mixed Drinks in that regard. There are just as many songs here that will break your heart as they will mend it too. And I think it is pretty much as easy to listen to, save for its like deeper, darker moments. Like State Hospital is a difficult to listen to song despite being as anthemic as it is. Um, and The Oil Slick is a song that every time I listen to it, it gets sadder and sadder just because I feel it really captures how it must feel to walk in Scott's shoes and the content of that song, the more I, I think about it, just displays a, a, an existence that would become 
tiring and I identify with that very, very much. But I think that Pedestrian Verse is as accomplished as an album like this is capable of being, and I love it very, very dearly. Bravo. Yeah. Okay, so not to bury the lead here, I also um, love this album. No, no, I can't be as hyperbolic about it as you two have been, but I think I, I love it a lot. Um, and I have not, not a bad word to say about any of the songs or the album. I'm just probably not going to be as consistently effusive, if that makes sense. Um, but I'm just going to run through, I didn't have time to do a write-up of album myself list, so I'm just going to run through my notes and try not to be redundant. Um, okay, so we have the opener, Axe of Man, we have these uh, sort of very reverby, woozy pianos on the intro, these haunting electric guitars come in. Uh, Scott refers to himself as an amateur pornographer, um, which I thought was an interesting metaphor of, of someone who sort of crudely makes things crude. Um, you know, takes this um, sort of the nuanced relationship and transforms it into something I, I think he sees as inefficient. Um, I th it's an interesting metaphor. Um, yeah, the, there's some falsettos on this track I find interesting, and the line, let's promise every girl we marry that we'll always love them. Uh, when we probably won't. Um, I love that line. Just it's like so poetic cool. beauty. I Backyard Skulls, also one of my favorite tracks on the album. Um, it's driving um, all these uh, backyard skulls. Um, <laughs> not so deep they will never be found. Um, it's got this sort of increased folk rock feeling on other records we see on songs like this and on songs like uh, The Woodpile, then push more towards this indie rock, alternative rock, post-punk influenced rock sound. Um, which, yeah, I, you know. I think people who are critical of, of a record like this, like they get, because they don't like the sound of it or like that, it reminds them of, a, of like an indie scene or like other bands that they don't like. There's re a real ignorance, I think, of like how powerful and impressive Scott's writing actually is. Um, like, because yeah. the, the more you, you can, you can, the more, the more you dig into all of these songs, and it's also true in, on Painting of a Panic Attack as well, in all mm -hmm. their albums, um, the more you kind of get rewarded by rich and insightful and layered and meaningful lyricism that just seems to be, seemed to be overlooked frequently um, by people who approach the band from a more casual perspective. They think, oh, this sounds like this, or this sounds like that, and they don't really kind of pay attention to what's going on or why it might sound that way. No, that's entirely fair. And I think that the sound is very well realized with luscious production. What, um, what I'm getting at is that I've so, I saw someone one time describe this as being like Mumford and Sons, and that's just... Oh, fuck off. Of my head. Get the fuck out of my home! I Even know. if you want no. to compare a Frightened Rabbit record to Mumford and Sons in its sound, this isn't the one. Um, anyway, but in a way, I... Um, yeah, no, I think the sound is beautifully realized. I think I tend to gravitate more to the sound of the last two albums, just on a taste level. But I think the sound is... A, I'm very excited that they break this ground further on this record. It's an exciting direction for them to go, and I think they do it well. Um, Holy has this almost um, emo-influenced guitar and drum orchestration. Uh, at points, almost reminding me of the self-titled Blink-182 record at points, in a good way. <laughs> Um, before moving into a chorus uh, I found in the vein of something like The Editors um, yeah yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I love again I love the chorus you're acting all holy when uh, you know I'm full of holes or you know I'm not whole or some you know variations upon the theme which even outside of the context of the religious commentary just applies to so many relationships I've had with people and the condescending attitudes they have or it's just like you know I'm trying. You know I know I'm trying. We understand where I'm at. I'm fucked up. I'm trying. Stop high horsing me. Um, <laughs> in that place far too many times. Um, again, I commented on the woodpile. It furthers the sort of the post-punk sound. 
really great song. One of the oldest songs to me that I've known to be a frightened rabbit song. I've been with it the longest, so sort of what I mean. Um, it's a really nice song. Um, Late March, Death March. The only note I have is the chorus in, in capital letters. Um, yeah. <laughs> because, yep. So, yeah, this is what I come away from that song with. It's just March, Death March. Even outside of any thematic commentary on the song, that this combination of anthemic uh, sort of folk beats um, with this sort of feeling of marching in a death march, um, almost in a way that, again, to compare it to an emo record, the best songs on the Black Parade do. Yeah. Um, where you feel like you're in this carnivalesque uh, day of the dead, march towards hell. But yeah. We're all getting pissed along the way, you know. That's the great thing, like about their songs, is that you get those kind of catchy, sticky, but meaningful hooks stuck in your head. And then, like, once you get to spend more time with the song, you realize, oh wow, there's actually so much more to it than that as well. Like, uh, folded arms, clutch homicide, bridges <laughs> out and rivers hide. So uh, march, death like, march. I love the, I love the winking, <laughs> I love the winking humor of. Like, I went the, too far. Sorry. Of, like, <laughs> I, I just love the kind of like situational and, and conscious humor. Of a line like "I cursed in church again" and the hand claps mm-hmm. all fell quiet, which is just hilarious. <laughs> the perfect oh, car nice. scream song, which they are so good at. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. Uh, and then we move on to some suggestions, which we've already talked a lot about. Um, I love the tremoloing of the guitars on this record. Um, it gives the whole thing this really eerie vibe, and. <laughs> To pick out another line that leaps out from the mix at me that I find particularly compelling, fuck the grief I'm leaving, uh, <laughs> stays with me particularly. Yeah. Fuck the grief I'm leaving. <laughs> <laughs> 10 out of 10 accent. Good job. Um, like, there's just particular yeah. words that I just really like. I, I adore the way that he announces yeah. them. Another one is buried. When he says buried. buried. It's interesting. I've been sort of getting Homicide. Into, uh, the Twilight <laughs> Sad recently. Yeah. Um, I think they make an equally good use of just being unapologetically Scottish. One, one uh, perhaps, Super Scottish. One reason, one like thing I've realised over the years that might partially explain why I love Scottish bands so much is the fact that when I sing in the car, I can kind of like, I, don't, I can't sing very well, but I can kind of mm-hmm. sing all right if I do a Scottish accent for some reason. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> it just sounds a bit better than, than my normal yeah. accent. So that's funny. <laughs> but also, like, if you turn the music off, it would probably sound like a really offensive invitation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I find it with this band and also Twilight Sad and also um, the best of Biffy Clyro records, where um, when they really embrace the Scottish accent, it gives the song like a texture and, and a grit um, to it. Um, that, yeah. Um, just gives you something to hold on to. It's like um, the divots on a golf ball, you know. Um, oh, oh, that's pretty. I like that. I like that. Yeah. Perhaps I also uh, find the connection to it as well, because I think pretty much most of my extended, in fact, all of my extended family on my father's side are Scottish. So I probably have like ancestry that I feel <laughs> no real attachment to, but that that feels appropriate to bring up here. And grab it, embrace I am allowed to make fun of the Scottish people. <laughs> Yeah, well, like I did, I did feel before when I was like commenting on like the the violence of British society that maybe I was coming across a bit like, you know, preachy for someone who's not British. But I do have that like. No, no, you're right. So. You're right. You're yeah, right. I, I was gonna say like if you want to criticize uh, like England or America right now, you're in a pretty good place to do that. We're not gonna fight you. Um, no, but I would. I, I certainly I'll, wouldn't want to, um, you know, come across as self-righteous well, in, in doing that. I will get on to um, some of the ways to have very accurately critiques uh, British society, particularly alludes to the results of how the way British politics is set up leaves Scotland without much control um, in politics, which is sort of which one might argue leads to sort of some of the troubles that Scotland has had, specifically on State Hospital. Um, like it's a very personal story, but two, uh, so my flatmate for two years, Scottish, his mum worked in the child support system in Scotland. Um, deeply informed a short film we wrote together that he's going to be directing soon. Very excited to see that. Um, and as a result, 
I have a modicum of understanding of the fact that you, because we kind of did it on the film we wrote together, you can't tell a story like this about it being specifically Scottish without it being inherently political about the way the British politics are structured. Yeah. Um, anyway, December Traditions <laughs> uh, was the next <laughs> one I was going to talk about. Um, no, I already talked about that. Dead Now was going to be the next song I was going to talk about. Um, I loved the guitar solo on the song so much. Um, yeah. This is also what, like their first record where big loud guitar solos make sense. Um, it fucking goes. It's so hard. <laughs> yeah, like like I already said, the solo on the wood pile just just destroys. Like yeah. it's a miracle I haven't been involved in an in an automobile accident. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine getting out of the car after you like rear end somebody, and then it's just like, oh, I'm sorry, I was listening to Frightened Rabbit, man. <laughs> No, just like getting out of the car and then just the guy's screaming at me I'm like, hang on, the solo's about to start. Hang on. We'll <laughs> deal with like this. We'll deal with this. Away. The damned. Um, and they have to sort of so like, no, wait, wait. Rewind it. Yo, I'm going to let you finish, but this Frightened Rabbit album has one of the best guitar <laughs> solos of all time. <laughs> like when it's like... Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yes. And when Scott says on this song, there's something wrong with me, I relate. Um, yep. Yeah, so then State Hospital opens with these very eerie organs um, into this absolutely haunting, upsetting, beautiful song. Um, I can't remember which song I said it about, but there was an Everything Everything song that I said feels like a lullaby you would sing to a child in hell. Undrowned. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Um, I feel like there's some kinship between these two songs. Um... Uh, I, there's the line where it's uh, a repeated line where he says, "Her blood is thicker than concrete, forced to be here, forced um, to be brave." For, for, oh, yeah, forced to be brave. I misread my notes. Sorry. Um, concrete, yeah, forced to be brave. She was born into a grave that is just um, so. It, it's very simple phrasing, but it feels so true to how we are, we are often born into the worst things about our lives um and i think it's a very specific story but it, you know if you have any congenital shitness in your life i think you can relate to some of what's going on here and be affected by it or if you know someone who is troubled by directly the themes on this then it will attack your heart um but again the refrain all is not lost Get, brings it back to the thing that I keep coming back to about Frightening Rabbit's music, which is, yes, it's sad uh, and it's honest and confrontationally, brutally, uncomfortably honest, but it constantly comes back to transcendence, to um, a sense of euphoric persevering. To bring it back to some Till You Can't See Land, the metaphor of the man to the bag of sand about going forward and, and staying alive through shitness is what makes us human is a recurring theme in his music and it's encapsulated in that line all is not lost just those four yeah four words mm-hmm. um yeah and then like just gas is a beautiful song um shut down the gospel singers is the first line immediately evokes for me uh wb Auden's poem funeral blues um Stop all the clocks, uh, turn the radio, you know, just in this state of grief, I, I want the world around me to stop. Um, which also ties into Last on Trace, Man and Collier, but I'm not going to go there. Um, it's sort of the themes of that movie. Um, it's a beautiful song. Um, uh, I'll, I'll swallow the self-loathing. I'm dying to be unhappy again. It just hits me in so many of my darkest places where you begin to internalize your own trauma um, I have had points in my life where things have started going well and I'm uncomfortable and sort of second guessing it. Um, and it's just like, well, I know this can't last for a particularly long amount of time because experience has taught me this. Um, and these lines evoke that in me. I haven't felt that for a long time. Um, yeah, but I it mean, brings it, me there's back. There's also the sentiment in the song of, of feeling like you're kind of like, your sadness is some kind of contagious disease as well. Like the line, yes. um, he's dying to bring you down with him. 
Like you yes. feel like everything you touch is going to be destroyed. Um, mm-hmm. yeah. Again, these seem surprising in Lars von Trier's Melancholia, but I'm not going to go there. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I look, um, I've no doubt that if Scott saw that film, he would have enjoyed it. He, he probably would have done more than me, but let's not talk about that. Um, anyway. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, Tyler has already touched on the central metaphor of nitrous gas, laughing gas being an artificial high. Um, in a way, it's it's about the performativity of happiness. Um, in a way, just the smile you put on when you meet people is like laughing gas. It is, it's a hollow affectation of uh, feeling okay. Um, and that's really powerful. And uh, this is, then we get the second half of the sort of two half interludes on the song. We had housing in, and now we have housing out. Um, yeah, and then the closer, the oil slick, which is really good. Really, really, really good. Um, yep. The, it blends um, the super fun guitars with the, the chorus, all the dark words. Uh, God, I can't read my handwriting. Um, all the dark words coming... Uh, Pouring from my throat. Thank you. That is what I wrote, but I was writing it very fast because the song was happening. Um, all the dark words pouring from my throat are like an oil slick. Um, uh, clogging up the wings. Uh, the wings we've grown. Yeah, thank you. The wings you'd grown is what I wrote, but I'll take your word for it. Um, God, I wish my handwriting was better. Anyway, oof, ow, like... Um, I've said before how all you can say about a line is, ow. You know, yeah, and, like, and also, if you've ever kind of, uh, and as all three of us have to different extents and in different contexts, if you've ever written for passion or for an extended period of time, the line, only an idiot would swim through the shit I write, has a particularly yep. direct resonance. <laughs> yes, um, yeah. but then taken in context this metatextual commentary in his own work applies to this chorus line. It's not just what he's saying, it's the art he makes. Yeah. Um, and, but it, it's the art you make expressing this thing you need to express, but simultaneously the thing you are expressing through your art is the thing pulling everyone around you into your shit. Yeah. Um, Beautifully said. Mm. Thank you. Um, yeah, which is the oil slick of the thing. It's a double-sided metaphor and both sides match up with each other um Brighton rabbit is very good at that yes yeah um, so just amazing poetry just gorgeous so that brings me to the end of my notes. so i guess i'll summarize that again my only stumbling block with this is i i guess like j- just the texture of their two previous records it resonates with me so much they are pushing towards um a sound that eventually comes back around to me really loving it. Um, but it feels like a transitionary moment in their sound. I, I don't have either end of the extreme to hold on to, but the actual writing itself is here and so strong um, that that's hardly a problem. Cool. Well, good job, everyone. Uh, let's do our favorite <laughs> track. Sounds Great. So- faces everyone <laughs> yeah exactly let's do our favorite tracks mm. and ratings yeah. uh yes jake do you want to go first yeah sure uh my three favorite tracks which fuck me that only picking three is hard but yeah. top three are nitrous gas late march death march and the oil slick mm. or wait no sorry <laughs> nitrous gas late march death march and state hospital i skipped over yeah. one here uh, and, uh, well, I mean, I hate to sound like a broken record again, but there is not a least favorite track <laughs> on here, and this gets a 10. <gasps> it does. Um, so for me, uh, my three, if I had to pick three, I would mm. pick... Um, Fucking Sophie's Choice over here. Well, obviously, State Hospital. Yeah. Pick- State Hospital is so obvious, I'm going to pick another three. <gasps> um, so... <laughs> Fuck off if you disagree. It's, it's it's valid. It's valid. I'm also gonna pick nitrous gas, uh, yeah. which is just a hell a song that you could I could basically run my lungs raw singing along to. <laughs> um, I also pick uh, actually I'll pick X of Man 
because I really love that but, song. Yeah. And I'm going to also throw in the wood pile. Uh, mm. And I don't have a least favorite track. I want to say, for, I want to say for the record that for so long, I didn't quite care for December is Traditions as much as the rest of the songs until I actually like sat down and really fully paid attention to what Scott was trying to do with it. And then I was like, I'm a fucking idiot. This song is amazing. And the album is a 10 out of 10. Hell nice. yeah. I am so happy for both of you. Um, my favorite tracks are probably Backyard Skulls, State Hospital. Yeah, fuck it, late march, death march. It's fun. Yeah. Um, I don't have a least favorite track, but I'm going to give this album an eight. Good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, Tyler. I'm sorry. We're going. I'm we, we, <laughs> it's seeming ever increasingly unlikely that we're going to have like a perfect um, set of yeah. three tens on this. But, yeah. but never mind. Well, cr- we're doing chronologically, yes? That means Owl John is up next? Yeah, so I'll give some context again. So uh, following a very lengthy tour for Pedestrian Verse throughout 2013, uh, the band took a break. Uh, they were burned out. As I alluded to earlier, Pedestrian Verse was the first record where all members had a collaborative part of the writing process. Um, and so that led to some tensions and to an exhaustive period of writing. So they decided to take a mini break, not a hiatus, but a mini break, uh, Scott moved to Los Angeles, crucially, um, to live with his girlfriend at the time, uh, and in the interim, recorded a solo project called Al John, uh, with the help of Andy from the band and the touring guitarist Simon Liddell, who would eventually join the band following G- Gordon Skeen's departure for Creative Differences, which also happened during this time. So Al John was released uh, in 2014. Uh, and yeah, someone want to talk about this one first? I'll go just because I don't have a lot to say other than I think this record's pretty great. Um, it's short, uh, which, you know, it's sort of an all killer, no filler situation. I don't really think there's a bad song on here. And to be quite honest, if you were like, if you were a Frightened Rabbit fan and you were just like, gosh, darn, I really wish there was another Frightened Rabbit record. <laughs> here you go i mean like yeah. i'm not trying to 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 boil it down like if there's yeah. no differences or that like there's not a like th- like this doesn't it's just like in name only another project but like yeah. it kind of mostly is like it's I mean, just I mean, produced a bit more like the midnight organ fight so you know if you were mm-hmm. a really big fan of that and you weren't super into how their sound progressed this is probably a really good detour to take um, I'd say it is probably the project we are covering that is the most consistently downbeat. Um, it doesn't have a lot of like the anthemic sort of rising songs that the other Frightened Rabbit records have, uh, but so it's a little bit more moody and contemplative, but it's also not long, so it's sort of, you know, it doesn't overstay, it's welcome. Uh, there's a lot of songwriting on here that is very personal but also a little bit more political this time around he not that he was a like a huge stranger to political illusions especially on pedestrian verse uh but there's a bit more directness here which i think is appreciated at least by me and lyrically speaking i mean like it's it's great what do you fucking what do you want from (laughs) me It, it, it sounds really good like i i appreciate the the rootsier approach to production but there are songs on here uh that i would rank among tons of the best frightened rabbit songs Uh, a good reason to grow old cold creeps stupid boy the again there is this one thing scott is just unfucking touchable at it is knowing how to open an album and knowing how to close it cold creeps and stupid boy prime examples of this fucking effect and uh I wouldn't say that it is as, it's not exactly what I would call an immediate record, but I would totally say it's essential listening. It's not a Sing the Grays situation. I think this is material that does deserve to be compared up with the Frightened Rabbit stuff. That said, when you do compare it with the best Frightened Rabbit stuff, it is not as good. And that's just kind of like, it, it's a shame just because the, the standard is set so high that the biggest problem this album has is that it's not like a masterpiece. And that's such a weird, nebulous criticism to make. 
But if you want something that's a little bit easier, like a little bit more melancholy to like digest in that specific way, like a little moodier, um, give this a fucking shot. It is not long, so even if you don't particularly enjoy it, it's not like you will have wasted a lot of your time. And if you don't like at least one of the songs on here, I question why you're a frightened rabbit fan in the first place, because that shit don't make sense. But yeah, I think this is great. Yeah, um, I'll just leave in there because my thoughts have already been covered extensively by Jake. I don't want to have nothing to say. Um, yeah, I agree. This record is very, very, very good. It is not as great as... It's not as good as even my least favourite Frightened Rabbit after their first one, which I'm not counting in that sentence. Um, I agree the Cold Creek and Stupid Boy are fantastic openers and closers. Uh, I want to highlight Los Angeles Be Kind and Songs About Roses. Which yes. Are songs About two. Roses is great. Songs About Roses is probably my favorite song on the album. It's, it's, it's Uncharacteristically very, bitter, but just very well written and good. Yes, it's very well written. It's very um, intimate and beautiful and sort of I mean, the whole record's very luscious, even if it's more stripped back than contemporary Frightened Rabbit releases. Intimate is a good word. Yeah, good reason to grow old. Also, very good song. Um, yeah, don't have a whole bunch to say. I like the sound of it. I like the vibe. I don't. I don't have a lot more to compliment it on other than the vibe. Um, but there are some really key songs here. If uh, I would happily listen to this again multiple times in a row. Um, fair enough. So I'll just preface what I have to say by saying this is by far, of all the projects we're discussing today, it's by far the one I have spent the least amount of time with, although I have listened Amen. to it Ditto here. a number of times over the years. I do think, however, that this doesn't even remotely compare to the other Fright and Rabbit albums. I think it's good. Uh, I do think that it is flawed, though. I don't love it or enjoy it as much as the two of you do, though I do think there's there's good stuff here. Uh, Cold Creeps is a great opener. I totally agree. It's, it's quite spare. It doesn't have a really a lot going on, but it's still got a quite moving and emotional ambience to it. A lot of gentle reverb and distortion on it. Um, two, the song Two is superb. Uh, Scott writes and sings in an almost stream of consciousness quality. Uh, it's much less direct and more literary than he typically is. Uh, and it even ends with a monologue in Gaelic. So <laughs> awesome. Uh, songs about roses i agree with Sersha. it's the best song on the record uh, it's an interesting diversion for scott into directly political commentary uh, as opposed to kind of alluding to politics in the subtext of a song like state hospital here it's kind of a, co a direct commentary considering the place and purpose of writing and singing about misery uh, even considering his own role as a musician and whether artists generally have a moral imperative uh, Los Angeles Be Kind uh, was sampled by Coldplay on their last album, uh, most recent album, Everyday Life. And it's one of the prettier and more fully formed songs on the album. Uh, even if I do think it ultimately feels a little bit slight compared to the Frightened Rabbit stuff. And generally the slightness I think is an issue that kind of does pervade a lot of this record. Um, songs like this one and 10 Tons of Silence reflect on Scott's place in Los Angeles but I don't think there's anything that has remotely the level of emotional clarity on this matter that, say, Still Want to Be Here has on Painting the Panic Attack. Um, that said, I will say across the board, the writing is fantastic. Uh, it's just the sound of this record and the arrangements don't grab me all that often, frankly. Uh, it does, the record ultimately feels like what it is, which is an earring of grievances and a desire to clear the slate and refine his identity as a songwriter after the discomforting but rewarding collaborative process of pedestrian verse. Uh, to me, though, what Owl John illustrates more than anything is how strong Frightened Rabbit were as a unit in terms of embellishing Scott's writing with more fulsome, larger-than-life arrangements. Uh, this, this is the sense in which it really doesn't compare to me to their four main records. Um, many of these tracks are superbly written, but lack the spark needed to bring them to life. And some, I think, even sound muddy and demo-esque at points. Uh, I, look, I have no doubt that had Scott more time to grow into himself as a solo artist, he would be able to release great albums both with and without his bandmates. But Al John, to me, feels a bit more like a curio 
a stopgap exercise necessary to reinvigorate his writing following the burnout of the presumably intense and draining uh, pedestrian verse tour. So ultimately, it is a good project. Um, but yeah, uh, with the exception of Grey's, it's comfortably the one that we're discussing today that I have the least attachment to and the least general uh, interest in and stimulation with while I'm listening to it. But I will still continue to spend more time with it uh, and hopefully it'll grow on me a little bit more. But yeah. yeah, I will agree with what Jake said. Where it's like we're going to talk about dance music later. And uh, it probably does not scratch the same itch as Frightening Rabbit's music does by itself. So it is still very good, spoilers in my opinion. Um, if, if you want a record that's like another Frightened Rabbit album, it's probably not as good, but will feed that need for that vibe. This is probably a decent medication for your Frightened Rabbit withdrawal. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, and I can't wait to talk about dance music because I think it's fulfilling for an entirely different reason. Um, yes, agree. Com completely, music. completely agree. But anyway, Al John is a good project. Um, I yes. just, yeah, yeah, I do. I think it has some flaws, but it is a good project. And certainly, if you're a fan of the band or a completist, you can't really go without it. Um, so my mm. favorite tracks are. Wait, has everyone spoken on this? Yeah, my favorite yeah. tracks are. Um, um, Cold Creek <laughs> Two and songs about roses. Uh, my least favorite track, uh, I, I don't have the tracks in front of me now, but I think there's a track called Red Hand or something like that mm -hmm. that I don't really care for. Yes, there um, is. So that's my least favorite track. Um, and I give it a 6.5. Solid. All right. I'll, I'll go next because I'm next to you on the document. Um, favorite tracks, Songs About Roses, Los Angeles Be Kind, Cold Creeps. Least favorite, I'm going to go with don't take off the gloves. I'm going to give this a, a I'm going to say a seven and, all oh, right, go on, and a half. Have one. No, ju you know, no, just seven. Go on, Jake. Seven. All right, cool. Okay, uh, my three favorite tracks are A Good Reason to Grow Old, Cold Creeps, and Stupid Boy. Uh, least favorite, probably Red Hand, and I give it a 7.5. Neato. Good stuff. Okay, so... Cont All right. More context. Um. <laughs> uh, so there's not actually a lot of context to give at this point. The band reformed yeah. uh, and they recorded uh, their what would prove to be their final studio album, uh, 2016's Painting of a Panic Attack, with Aaron Dessner of The National behind the boards. Mm -hmm. um, I'll get into it. I'll discuss a little bit of that sound when I do my review. But okay, who would like to go first on this? I would Anyone? like to nominate myself because... Um, it, it'll be obvious why. Yeah, okay. I just know that we're all probably going to have a lot to say, so if anyone yeah. has a particular order... Um, you know, audience, brace yourselves. Uh, we did do a uh, trigger warning at the beginning of this of sorts. I would like to reiterate that now. If it didn't prickle you before, you might be okay, but things are going to get a little bit more explicit here, so warning reiterated. Um, just before saying. you jump in, uh, I just want to ask Sersha if it's okay if I go last. That's fine. If Jake's going first. Okay, yeah, go. I think Tyler going last is a, is fitting. Alrighty, Jake, it's all yours. Okay, so. <clears throat> right. So. Here we are. This is my favorite Frightened Rabbit album, and one of my all-time favorites in general, so I guess it's very on brand of me to overshare. Mm -hmm. I do this, though, with very specific intent not only out of a desire to share my experience, but because I think it's necessary. Frightened Rabbit's music and Scott by extension evoke this kind of content out of you. This is the only way I can properly relay exactly why this music is as special as, and important as it is. The legacy of this work connecting us through our pain and our trauma is what I think what Scott would have wanted. Not that I'm claiming to speak for him, I'm not. It's an estimate I'm making. And it's what any artist would want to do with emotionally evocative and personal works. Simply put, there is no way to talk about this band, but more specifically this album with any modicum of honesty without also talking about my own story. So for the first time in my life, I will share that story. Uh, this is not going to detail my entire life, even though it might start off and sound like that, but bear with me, please. 
I grew up an only child in Lexington, Kentucky. My parents separated when I was very young, and my mom and I lived with my grandparents for a while. During this time period, I was not a social child, mainly interacting with adults. The only time I did was usually at church, as I was brought up in a Southern Baptist household. I still mostly stayed away from other children, but there were rare exceptions. The most notable exception was the child of someone my mother knew, and for the sake of discrepancy and privacy, I will refer to them from here on as Mark, a child a few years younger than me, with whom I attended daycare with. We would occasionally go over to each other's houses as our families had a lot of history. Even as we grew older and I moved, I would see him every once in a while. We were, by no means, close in any way. Just friends who were both generally considered to be shy and shared some interests. We spent many days on the playground outside the church as kids. I remember vividly sitting behind him and his mother in church as he played an old Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles game on his Game Boy Advance, and I would pay far more attention to that than whatever the preacher was saying. I saw him less and less as the years went on, especially once I moved to Georgetown and began grade school and middle school properly, I saw him less. It still happened occasionally, and my final memory of Mark was meeting him at the local pool one summer and catching up with him after not seeing him for a few months. It was a good time, and I look back on it fondly. Mark, to put it bluntly, was the first person I ever knew that died. I had attended one funeral in my life, that being the funeral of an older aunt in my extended family who I had seen when I was very young. So I was familiar with the experience in a way, but I had never experienced true loss before. My mom told me that Mark had died when I came back from school one day. She told me he was found in his closet and he had hung himself. I despondently nodded and went to my room for the remainder of the day and did nothing but think about him and the concept of mortality in general. I didn't even cry. I was in disbelief more than anything. I just didn't really understand how he could be gone. I gradually found out details and circumstances regarding his death through my mother. The details were, to put it mildly, grossly upsetting. Mark had apparently struggled with anxiety and depression for a long time, just as I had, even though this was long before I was diagnosed and put on medication. However, where our similarities ended was his home life. Mark's mother had remarried a man with a child of his own, and his mother had grown negligent of him as time went on. She treated him harshly, and he became more reclusive, staying mostly in his room for the last few years to avoid being seen. He was a ghost in his own home and was treated like he barely existed. His grades fell. The only interactions with his mother he had were about academic decline. I never knew about any of this, but I put myself in his place and it broke my heart. The love of my mom was one of the few things I had in my life that kept me going through my adolescence. I grew terrified at the thought of what would happen had I been put in his shoes to feel like a ghost in the place where you were supposed to be loved and valued, and I could hardly fathom it. As I grew older, my own problems got worse. Adjusting to the social climate of attending the largest high school in the state after going to a private school for so long proved very hard for me. My friends and I, oh, sorry, my sophomore year, I made many mistakes and was horrible at communicating with even my close friends, and I was pushed into a place of extreme discomfort. For years at my previous school, I was bullied for being emotional and overly feminine because I often had mood swings and intense emotional reactions to things that other people didn't, which I later learned was the burgeoning of my manic bipolar disorder and depression, which worsened a lot in high school. I ultimately hit a low point that winter, getting to the point where I would skip school occasionally because I was unable to get out of bed. I wasn't just plagued with my own dark thoughts, I also frequently thought about Mark. This ultimately escalated into self-harm. For a few months, it was severe. I dressed mostly in hoodies to hide myself as best I could. My goal was not attention, but an attempt to actualize my pain, to validate it, to make it visible to myself and no one else. I could understand it and feel less alone if I felt like it meant something and wasn't just an abstract sickness in my head. I attempted suicide twice that year, once with a belt attached to the top of my bunk bed and the other with a small hunting knife in my bathtub. The first, I couldn't go, first time I couldn't go through with it and stop myself. The second time I did, but out of shame, I stopped the bleeding quickly and bandaged myself to hide it. However, I could only hide it all for so long. When we moved into our new house that year, my mother saw marks on my arms and wrists while moving furniture, and she nearly collapsed, crying because she assumed it was her fault and that she had failed as a parent. I did my best to convince her that that was the furthest thing from the truth. Once we got our heads straight, we talked it out, and we agreed that I would see a doctor, and get put on something for my depression. I was, and was then diagnosed with manic bipolar too. 
things did steadily get better, and my mental health has not sharply plummeted like that since it did since then. I have episodes, isolated incidents, but it didn't get bad again for a long time. In the following years, I still thought about Mark a lot. Because I felt I understood him more, I tried to think about him as often as I could. I won't be overly saccharine and say that I think of him every day, because I don't, but I try to, as often as possible. In a desperate act of remorse and guilt that I feel, I remember and think of him because I knew his final act was an attempt to escape not feeling seen, a cry to not be invisible. And to me, he isn't. I won't let what happened to him be the end, and I'll think about those days in the playground and the days in the church and remember him properly, as a friend who deserved and as a friend who deserved better. I know it perhaps doesn't hold the tightest of logic, but these things never do. I still feel guilty I wasn't there to this day. I was far from his best friend, but now I am frequently confronted with the fact that he still needed a friend more than anything else in the world. And in some reality, some other perfect world, I could have been that. The residual regret often gets to me because I always find a way to burden myself unnecessarily, but it is always still there. In question of what if, what if I talked to him? What if I kept in touch with him? What if I was closer to him? Maybe I could have helped. And this feeling has followed me. I suspect it will not leave. I have had a long time to make peace with it and I don't know if I can. A part of me thinks he'd want me to, but I don't want to presume for him. A lot of it too is the guilt of knowing that I am not alone. That I was not unlucky enough to be stricken with the loneliness he had. I know deep down that if I was alone, both then and many other times, I would not be here. But as I put it in my segment of Transgender Dysphoria Blues in the Against Me episode, I know I have my friends. Friends like the two people here. Friends like Morgan, my best friend in the whole world who I met at a time when I needed him most, where I felt seen and understood by someone who had similar experiences. Someone who shares my passion and drive and love for things that we value the most. And someone I can confide in like no one else. Somebody who supported me through every endeavor I've had. I have friends like Sersha, who flew across the ocean last year to see Morgan and I. We had the best week of our lives with just the comfort of one another, some drinks and some movies. I have friends like August, who I've known for years behind a wall of anonymity. Some, someone I've known for nearly as long as I've known Morgan and who I have banter with frequently, but look at, look at as the little brother I never had because I'm proud of him and the way I've seen him grow. I have friends like Tyler, who despite me not knowing him for only a year now, feels like a miracle of a person because of his passion, his drive, and his intelligence, and his ability to profess his love for the things he feels strongest about. And that's why this group, this podcast, and in my opinion, this album is so special. Painting of a Panic Attack, the final Frightened Rabbit album, like the building shown on the front cover of the record, is a monument amidst the gray. I mean this both symbolically and literally, as the original title for the album was Monuments, and the building shown is an Eastern European gas station, something Scott was enamored with the look of, because something that fueled things looked like such a monument amidst a desolate wasteland. The idea that this is a monument feels apt, as it does feel like a monument to Scott. I was trying my best to think of just why exactly this album in particular was both my favorite Frightened Rabbit album and the one I found most difficult to talk about. And upon my first listen, I think I knew without even realizing that this was the band's final effort before Scott died. It's because without the context of the band around it, Painting of a Panic Attack still sounds like what a depressive relapse sounds like. The album begins with Death Dream, which sets the tone about as well as anything possibly could. My favorite album opener, and one of the songs tied for being my favorite of all time. This puts you in the exact headspace to digest what follows. The death dream in question is left up to interpretation in many respects as the song is abstract and non-literal and changes viewpoints midway through. The poetic descriptions of finding someone reduced to nothing but a suicide asleep on the floor are soul-wrenching as the ethereal mood is constructed around the instrumentation, making it sound full in a way other Frightened Rabbit albums haven't yet. It's a song about uncovering visceral loss and feeling a connection to that loss to the point where it feels like you yourself have died. It is referred to as being something one cannot forget, and as someone who lives with loss, I can attest to the song's truth, as it's saying that even, Scott's, even in Scott's dreams, he must tread with care in order to avoid the dark thoughts regarding this. 
shimmering bells and scots, at distant echoing vocals describe every single moment of discovery of the event, a perfect painting of a moment captured forever, saying, the last I will see you, the painting of a panic attack, a metaphor beautiful in and of itself, and a great drop of the title of the record, but this single image capturing being a representation of what was lost, it's hard not to feel as Scott does about his dream as I do about Scott's passing. This is the last thing we will hear from him, his painting of an eternal moment of loss and pain. The next song, Get Out, is a heartbreaking recant of a lost love that refuses to vacate Scott's mind, plaguing him as he attempts to exercise her from him. Dissonant guitars scream out helplessly between the verses and chorus as if calling for help. The repeat of get out of my heart, she won't, she won't, over and over, emphasizes the magnitude of the struggle to not let past heartbreak wound you. As I alluded to in my Punisher segment a few months back, I can easily relate to the subject matter because of an emotionally abusive relationship that caused my own horrifying relapse last year and how it simply refuses to totally vacate my head even though it's months in the past. It is a constant battle that is never older, over. The buzzing synths that conclude the song feel like a quickened heartbeat fully racing and fading out, implying some form of closure to this issue, but it leaves it up to interpretation if this closure is due to death or just moving on. I Wish I Was Sober is an aching plea for freedom from Scott's vice of alcohol, which I think is as upfront and honest as he's been about trying to get clean in his music so far. Anyone who's fallen victim to substances in any kind of difficult time will find something in this, as Scott's vulnerability is dug in even further. Little Drum finds him contemplating on getting older and aging, saying that there's an internal part of you that starts to malfunction once you reach the age of 25, which is the year the human brain stops developing. Someone has obsessed with their own mortality, as Scott ruminating on this is hardly surprising, but his worry of his youth being behind him and the weakness of adulthood cracking him feels like a monolithic weight to be under. Still want to be here, context aside, may be the most heartbreaking thing I've ever heard from this band or not. Posthumously, this song carries with it a cruel and inescapable irony on first listen, but Scott's powerful lyricism about finding the few things worth focusing on in life amidst the sea of potential suffering with his gentle, harmonious pleas of saying he still wants to be here, and it claws at your soul in a way very few things can. The amount of honesty and weakness it takes to write this is only rivaled by the amount of strength Scott performs it with, making it an ode to the things in life we either take for granted or love. An otherwise disappointing life is an anthem, an inspirational look at finding solace in other human beings and the company and warmth they bring. I feel there's a progression here, as on the Midnight Organ fight, we see him saying things like, it takes more than fucking someone you don't know to keep warm. And in a way, I find this to be an unofficial continuation of this proverb. As Scott seems to have found that, th as Scott seems to have found that something more in someone else that keeps him warm, using what he's encountered in the last two albums as a building block of sorts. Here we see him find hope and yearning in another uh, amidst a wave of dissatisfaction with his own existence, something I think anyone who relies on their friends and loved ones can attest to the power of. Break is a comparatively upbeat song that dwells on the realization and subsequent pain of codependency and support. As Scott details how much it pains him to realize the people he's hurt along the way, casting his blame inwards not to disparage himself, but hold himself accountable. The song's title, Break, is cleverly alluded to indirectly in the verses with the lyrics, I didn't bend, and now we eat the consequence, as if owning up to the fact that he could have bended without breaking. And he's finally found a middle ground and realized his mistake, which I think I see myself in as I let my emotions take the best of me sometimes, and it blinds me to the feelings of others. He says if he learns how to bend, he might be okay. Words of wisdom that I think are invaluable for anybody. Blood Under the Bridge is an ode to not letting your sadness, depression, or weakness embody or represent who you are. Scott embraces these things as being a part of him, but also acknowledges giving himself some credit, saying that these things are more than the sum of what you feel. Your character is not defined by your emotions, which as someone with bipolar disorder is something I have to continually tell myself to keep going. His calm reassurances of it's all right, it's all right, feel genuinely comforting. The whole song carrying the tone of someone trying to pass down sagely advice with a sense of reverence and humility. 400 Bones is a slightly abstract and heartbreaking song about the company of a lover whose absence has haunted Scott to the point where he can only treasure what's left behind. 
the titular bones being representative of memories and time. As Scott alludes to things like past historical events and mausoleums, and the bones being a method of preserving the happiness that he once felt seeing a lover sleep beside him in bed. The 400 bones being the culmination of his own skeleton and another, as if referring to himself as a bygone memory. Lump Street is easily the darkest song sonically on the album at first. Another thematic cousin to keep yourself warm, as it seems to be finding, it seems to be about finding the company of someone to have sex with in an unseemly environment filled with darkness that reflects Scott's own internal darkness, making it feel inescapable. Metaphor upon metaphor used to describe both the main character of the song as someone harsh and lonely by saying that they're raised by wolves and wearing scars like armor, and even painting the act of sex as being violent and unseemly, wearing muscles and kissing scars away, bruising, like sex is some sort of incomplete baptism. But then at the end, the song switches up and the two people escape the darkness of Lump Street. As the song brightens with Dresner's luscious production's finest moment, and the lyrics painting their escape as glorious, telling them to get together, to find hope, telling them that there is a life beyond the one that brought them there, that they have to build. And as the song ends in a complete tonal 180 from how it began. And last, we have Die Like a Rich Boy, which is tied with the opening track of this record as being not only my favorite track on here, but my favorite closing track ever and my favorite song. Scott begins pondering with gentle plucks of an acoustic guitar about someone who can rip him from the world he paints as cold and unforgiving. A world filled with dissatisfied lower class people, of crying children, and a world where he's reminded of death everywhere he goes. He treats death not as defeat, but here he decides to embrace it and uses it as an act of defiance, refusing to die in, how he says, the bony arms of the state. And in this song, he envisions dying with someone else, someone who wants to escape like he does, perhaps implying the characters from the last song or the characters here, but paints death as being something serene and beautiful rather than inherently painful. He then wishes to, as the song implies, die like a rich boy in order to give his death and the death of his partner with some amount of grandeur and meaning, as if everyone in the world will see this for what it is and they can be known and understood through this one final act of rebellion, cloaked in a class-conscious serenade in order to get the absolute best out of his final moments. As the rich might do, proposing things like drowning in a lake with his name. Even if he's poor, he says, he wants to leave with a bang. A further connection to the last song is in the final verse, where he says, well, you found me, so tear me away from the feral street they lumped us in probably a reference to Lump Street itself, and then suggest their final moments be one of a dramatic reenactment where he plays, as he puts it, Shakespeare's Moonstruck King, a reference to King Lear, someone who went mad in his respective tale. We can burn cash and carry a decadent flame way into the night and beyond the grave, or the final words as the song calms from its middle swell, suggesting that, de that through death, they can live on, burning a symbol of capitalistic greed and injustice that keeps them from having equal deaths amongst one another. The fact that these are the final moments on the final song of the final Frightened Rabbit album does not escape me as being not ironic. It is a song that paints death as both romantic and tragic, a last disparate plea from a man who had been torn apart enough and wanted the pain to stop. A song I have, I have near screamed along to in the middle of the night as I've driven home. As my moments of suicidal ideation frequently grace this song's exact thought process and themes. A song that understands how it feels this, to be this way and to want to get the most out of one intangible feeling you have left. It is the song that puts me at ease, hoping that maybe Scott saw dying as being not a last resort or a terrifying escape, but instead just the next step in the progression of existence. In summation, I think that's what makes this song and this album so important and meaningful. It's easy to see the sadness and even real life despair knowing it was the final record from the band and that Scott's death soon followed two years after. It could be seen as difficult knowing that in a long and arduous battle, the man responsible for all this wonderful art lost. And while it's difficult to reckon with, I think it's not about what we lost with Scott's death or the death of anyone we've loved. It is about what we left behind and what they leave behind for us, what he left behind. 
It is, in essence, a monument to the good he did and the people he helped. A towering headstone for a career meant to exercise and fight demons, to claim hard-fought victories, and to revel in the things that make us feel small, but the things that bring us together. For every tragedy of Scott's passing, and for the passing of all who we once knew, there is at least one miracle left behind, evidence that they fought to be here. These things can be as small as a memory or a prayer or as large as a prolific career that could only be made by someone whose talent and love was put towards the things that they were truly passionate about, difficult and ugly things. Painting of a panic attack is Frightened Rabbit's darkest hour, but it is also a shining and resplendent reminder that every battle, no matter if we win or if we lose, is one that is worth fighting until its conclusion. Oh, that was, yeah, I feel so deeply honored that, that you shared that with us. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, no, absolutely. Um, thank you for everything. God. Ah. God. Sorry. Okay. Um, I'm. I'm sorry. You have to follow that. I know that's probably not hard, easy. No. 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 It's fine. It's fine. Um. I. Uh, I just want to say again. As I've said before, that I'm so very deeply honoured to do this with all of you, and that, you know, of course, goes with the people who aren't here. Um, but on top of that, I'm just honoured to know all of you outside of this, and uh, I, don't know. I have a lot of love to give, and I'm glad it's found a home in some of you. Yeah. Um, I, I, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, the same <laughs> from me. <laughs> I love you both. You're wonderful. Yeah. And I'm thrilled to be here. And I'm thrilled to be here, not just here, but I'm thrilled to be breathing right now. Yeah. Okay. So there's no way I can top that. Um, <laughs> it's not about topping. It's no, no, it's, no. it's, uh, it's about you and your experience, yeah, and that's what's so important. Outside uh, of one song that I do want to elaborate on, I'm going to throw away the notes I made and speak generally about the album and about Frightened Rabbit. Um, it's going to be very stream of consciousness because I'm processing how I feel as I speak. Um, but. I don't know, I maybe understated before quite how important this band were to me when I listened to them. It's probably why I took to Scott's passing so badly and completely couldn't go back to their music because it had been such a beacon of, of hope for me in some of my darkest times. This is... It's very hard for me to see this record as a final resignation which it is screaming out to be looked at as in the context of things but yeah uh, just a, a relevant point of context on that note is that uh at the time of scott's death uh they had begun working on the follow-up to this album mm. no sure but it, part of that for me is that ah uh, like every record before it this it's it's the music is still so deeply hopeful and the lyrics are so bleak um, and it's amazing how much talking the sound and the texture does. Um, on that note, this is well, not the final culmination, but the peak of the trajectory the sound was taking. Um, and I think it works super, super fucking well on this record. Um, it evokes such an atmosphere. Um, Almost every song is focused so much on the tone it creates, on the mood, on the, on the melancholy meeting, the joy meeting, the terror meeting, the sadness. Um, 
it's it's crazy to think that a record so lusciously produced and evocative came from something as stripped back as Midnight Organ Fight. Um, and yeah, Frightened Rabbit were there for me when I needed them. And I, and I find myself now again in one of the darkest periods that I've had to deal with. It's not as dark as that time, but it's up there. Um, I won't go into detail of everything that happened mainly because it would take a long time, but also it would require me talking about things about other people without their consent that I don't talk to anymore. Um, but needless to say, I was an arsehole and hurt people who didn't deserve it. Um, but what I find now compared to then is I have so much more hope now. And part of that is knowing all of you. I feel like I have people who will be there for me long term in a way I didn't. So going back to this music and hearing it as the music of a band, a group of friends coming together to make it is so very deeply affecting. Um, it's a wonderful album. I can't, Jake has already said so much about every record and he analyzed it so perfectly and succinctly that I don't feel like I have anything else to add about the meanings of the song. I just I do want to talk about the closer by like a rich boy. Um, starts by evoking these um, the car crime babies in the switchblade days, which so specifically evokes a kind of Thatcherian British city dwelling um, that you will see in March media coming from those places. Um, it compares class mobility to the halcyon dream of the afterlife or the peace of death. Um, this is how he dies like a rich boy, even if they are as poor as they are now, because it's a, a, a resignation to fate. If being rich is equivalent to the um, unknowable afterlife, which is the comparison in the song, then death makes him rich. The the think because in his position being wealthy and rich in money this character's position anyway feels so unattainable that's how the afterlife feels to them as well it's this kind of blissful peace that we will that we can't know but the single piece of wealth he has is this relationship with this person who he loves so in, in dying together, they become this extraordinary, beautiful symbol of spiritual peace. And, um, it's a song about just wanting to have only this love, only that forever. And it's interesting that Jake mentions King Lear, because that is a play in which a massively wealthy king is brought low by the lack of love he shows and his lack of understanding of love. And the ending of the play is a nihilistic mess of not knowing what comes next. Whereas in this one, it's about poor people being lifted up by love. And at the end of their lives, they have each other. It's the complete inverse and it's such a beautiful parallel. Um, so yes, Frightened for Die Like a Rich Boy feels like, in context, the band sailing off into the sunset. Um, it's a harsh goodbye, but a, but a statement that just because I lost doesn't mean you have to. This album in context feels like... Um, Scott passing the banner to the rest of us to continue his message and how we live now. 
and his wish to continue. The way we honour that is by continuing ourselves. And I'm someone who has had... <laughs> I have struggled at that in the past. Um, God, I... Um, you know, I just put out the EP I did. So I, I understand how hard it is to, to be this brutally honest about how bad it is. But also how necessary it is. Um, it's interesting that the opening track reminded me a lot of the last album about from the artist I last did a B-Sides on. Um, in this f- first track of Carrying Lol, Death With Dignity. I feel like they have a kinship, but they're two very different kinds of trauma. And I just I just want to wrap this up by saying that frightened frightened rabbits music now is an impassioned plea to keep going. Yeah, it it beautifully said, both of you. you. Um. So yeah, I wrote a little bit of a story last night about my first experience hearing this album. Uh, it, it's, yeah, it's, it's not necessarily as mired in tragedy as, as other stories are, but like it still is, I think, the, the clearest way I can explain how I feel about this record. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to do that. And I'm sorry mm-hmm. that it will take a while. Oh, don't worry. All the time you need, man. <sighs> mm-hmm. Painting of a Panic Attack was released the day before my birthday. Let's rewind a bit. I remember vividly when the album was announced and the first track was dropped. It was the 20th of February 2016, a Saturday. It was the day that I moved out of home for the first time to a new city to start my first year of university. I was 18 years old. Uh, I had been a Frightened Rabbit fan for about five months, I think, at that time. Uh, The new album announcement caught me by surprise. For whatever reason, I had never considered that a new record might be imminent in the short time that I'd known the band, despite being absolutely in love with their previous records, a love that has only grown stronger and stronger since then, as I think I've shown. The song that they released on that Saturday, alongside the album announcement, was the opening track, Death Dream. I dutifully downloaded it the morning I was due to leave, and I decided for whatever reason to wait to listen to it until I was in the car. As we left the boundary of the town I grew up in, those opening piano chords began to play, and I was instantly transported in my head, as in reality, to somewhere new. This was a different sound for the band, even more direct somehow than they had ever been before. It was ostensibly a ballad, but crisp, polished with a layer of almost shivering ambience, conveying the coldness suggested by the cover art. More on that later. I became aware that the new album was produced by Aaron Dessner of The National, and a few things then clicked into place. I had been a National fan for years at that point, and I came to realize that this was going to be a Frightened Rabbit record specifically tailored for people like me. I believe another track, maybe two, were released before the album finally dropped. Though I will say I don't really remember fully my first experiences with those singles as well. Hearing the album for the first time, though, I do remember. As I said, it was the day before my 19th birthday when Panic Attack was released. It was a Friday and it rained all day and all through the night. Uh, It had already been a significant year for me in the time since Death Dream first got released. Uh, I had come to quickly adjust to a new city and a new living situation in a hall of residence with a group of lovely people that I'm still proud to call friends. 
though I didn't quite realize it yet, a relationship was blossoming between me and another person that would culminate in exactly a month from this day with a fully fledged mutual realization that we were, in fact, in love. And I'm pleased to say still are. <laughs> So this was a year that was going pretty damn well for me, all things told. So why then would I find such a significant resonance in such a dark, solemn and tragic album? And particularly in a song as utterly gut-wrenching as the suicide fantasy of Death Dream. Well, all things told. While a lot was going well for me on the outside, the early months of 2016 were a time of total fucking emotional turmoil that nearly crippled me entirely, psychologically speaking. In February, I think on the 7th, uh, a deeply devoted relationship that I had been in for nearly two years ended abruptly with the stark and sobering realization from my then partner that a long distance relationship, which would be necessary once I moved to the city, would not ultimately be feasible for the two of us, despite us having already agreed and discussed many times that we wanted to try it. This came as a huge blow and was later underlined by the fact that a person that my partner had grown close to in the months before our breakup very quickly became their new partner. This breakup left me unfixed, dazed in a state of no closure and an emotional bedlam. It was not even the most emotionally devastating breakup I had experienced at that point, but it did feel difference. I somehow felt less prepared for it than I had been the first time I experienced heartbreak. But at the very least, I would have a chance this time to lift myself from a depression like the one that my previous breakup had induced by moving to the city and meeting new people. I was excited, nerve-wracked, but excited. The first time I heard Death Dream sitting in the back seat of that car while my mother and aunt chatted idly was also the first time that I cried since the day of that breakup. It was not that Scott's frank portrayal of a bloody nightmare drew some kind of emotional recognition in me. I, I was not suicidal at the time, really, in the slightest. But as with all of Scott's music, the emotional truth in the way he wrote and the way he brought it to life allowed the universality of the feeling to transcend the source material. I cried not for the death dream itself, but for lines like, a still life is the last I will see of you, my painting of a panic attack. The last time that you see someone that final image of the final moment becomes burned into your head and if the depth of feeling is there it can become a portrait of your inner turmoil my own struggle my own failure to let go uh something i don't think i don't even think i was fully cognizant of became glaringly apparent focusing in front of me as scott sang even now, when I'm asleep, I'll tread with care, Scott sings at the close of the song. And it served as a reminder to me, sitting in that car. When I'm deep inside, wandering around the fragments of my memories, trying to piece things together, I will not linger on the harm. I will not let the harm attach itself to new things to good things. I will amass a strength I did not know I had. On the night that Painting of a Panic Attack was released, I chose not to listen to it during the day, uh, figuring that nighttime would be more appropriate, 
Uh, and in fact, I actually came close to just putting it off to my birthday itself. Uh, I was sitting in my room, wavering over the play button, wondering if I should go somewhere different to listen to this than a dimly lit claustrophobic bedroom. Uh, I looked outside and I saw that the rain that had been plaguing the whole day was still pattering insistently. And I just eventually decided, fuck it. I grabbed a coat. I grabbed my earplugs and my phone and I headed out into the night. I can trace every step of this journey. I listened to Death Dream again as I escaped the street lights outside my hall, descending a narrow and steep street, the likes of which there are many here in Dunedin, New Zealand. Before I had reached the bottom, Get Out had begun and I stared across a quiet five-way intersection as the guitars rollicked and banged insistently. Mixed by legendary producer Alan Mulder, who engineered all the most legendary records of bands like My Bloody Valentine, Smashing Pumpkins, and Nine Inch Nails, the chorus of the song roars to life dynamically. Even as it is a bit more lyr lyrically straightforward than Scott's choruses usually are, though there's plenty of unusual rhythmic writing during the verses to satisfy anyone who feels that hook may be lacking. By the time I reached the end of Get Out, I was staring at another intersection, a rugby field on my left, lit up in the rain with rowdy students brawling and kicking around, drunk and blissed beyond my comprehension. I wish I was sober grew to become one of my favorite songs on the record, an utterly devastating portrait of becoming lost in your own inhibition, in many senses a companion piece to the winter of mixed drinks foot shooter. In describing the song, Scott scowled. There's no heroism in this, referring to his alcoholism. It's fucking pathetic. It's to his credit as a songwriter that the track does not come off as simply moping in one's self-loathing. It is a beautiful, twisted, emotional portrayal of regret and the burden of wanting to throw yourself off the deep end but being burdened by the concerns of your loved ones. I, I feel that this song captures a particularly dark sentiment that few people who have never been suicidal realize. Reminding suicidal people that they have people who love them is not necessarily always a pleasant affirmation, but it can serve as a blunt reminder of your own failures and the sensation of being trapped in life because of others. My love, you should know, the best of me left hours ago, so shove a rag into my mouth and let me smolder. By this point in my journey, I had left the dimly lit streets and arrived on the university campus, brightly lit by countless LEDs and dotted with controversial security cameras. I remember looking up at the gigantic tablet that declares University of Otago and feeling the rain on my forehead as Scott sang, come and shake me till I'm dry. Then, if anything, I wished I were not sober. Woke up hurting builds from sober, capturing the feeling of a painful morning after, Scott casting images of himself awakening in the gutter. A carcass starts to breathe, hurting with dirty knees, though not for the first time. The chorus is an anthemic stomp with acoustic guitars, hand claps, and hard-hitting drum breaks. One of the more musically uplifting on the record, though unmistakably downbeat in sentiment and vocal style. This is a song that captures real pain and does so with an unmistakable and haunting beauty. As the sl hours slow down, they all clock out of the cracked up daily grind. I'm in a back, back street coming down. I live for the beam of light. It was instantly a favorite of mine and my gentle walk through the rain broke into a stomp-like strut 
if temporarily, as the song's pulse took hold. Little Drum is among the more understated and murky tracks on the record, a kind of spiritual sequel to Skip the Youth, where Scott examines his own aging and the fragility of both his body and spirit to the weathering of the years. His depression and the sensation that some awful calamity must be upon him, the constancy of that unresolved feeling, that's what depression really is. I waited for the crash to come. I waited, but nothing came at all. By this point, I was staring directly at my university's famous clock tower, lit by night lights and unregarded by an obscured moon. The rain at this point was persistent, but not intense. It was more like a, it was more than a light mist, but it was hardly a downpour. Across the river that separated me from the campus's center was a seat at the foot of the tower. I headed across the bridge as Still Want to Be Here began. Building on themes visited on Al John, this song is very directly about Scott's experience in Los Angeles, living with his girlfriend, the feeling of being surrounded by a world of shit and suffering, but pushing through everything for the one thing that redeems it all. Fuck these faceless homes and everyone who lives in them, but I still want to be here. When you were hanging by a thread, even if it is something as tenuous as a relationship keeping you tethered, you will take what you can get. That was a feeling I knew too well as I slunk across the bridge and through the rain, reflecting on the things and pointedly the people that meant that I still wanted to be here myself. I sat in the seat I had spied from afar and listened to an otherwise disappointing life, bring an album that threatened to dissipate into gloom back to life. As much as I had enjoyed much of the album so far, particularly Death Dream, Sober and Hurting, I was waiting for the spark that would fully light it. And this was it. It's a brilliant surging track with Scott's trademark emotional intelligence and poetic insight on full display. On an otherwise disappointing night, there's a fire. I don't need water, I just want to wave goodbye to an otherwise disappointing life. Scott does adjust the lyrics as the song progresses though, ultimately fulfilling the happier ending that the previous track suggested. In this hollow chapel suffering the silence, you're the choir that brings this otherwise disappointing life back to life. At this point, sitting in the rain, gently drenched but hood draped over my head so as not to let the rain drown my earbuds, I noticed a message from my friend that another friend of ours was in the hospital. This may sound strange, but I genuinely can't remember what for. Uh, the person who was hospitalized was not someone I knew terribly well, nor really cared for that much. But at the same, it was upsetting news, especially at a time where I was thoroughly entrenched in the dark emotions of a new Frightened Rabbit album. Uh, I, um, the hospital was not far from the university campus, so of course I decided I'd better join my friend in supporting our friend while they waited to be seen. I restarted Break, which had been playing idly for a minute or two, and set off. Break is a curious song, uh, a short but energetic rocker, which seems to situate Scott in some kind of devastating situation, trying to make a crucial decision whether to bend or break. Uh, I do love, as much as I do love Jake's um, more positive interpretation of this song, I have to be honest and say I do not have a positive interpretation of this song personally, um, from, my, from my personal connection to it. Uh, Listening to the lines over the edge, I can't stop myself off the ledge, throwing punches over the edge, I can't steer myself all over again, I don't want this. 
at the time seemed to resonate with me as the feeling of being blind, out of control to the forces around you, lost among the calamity of your decisions and their implications. If I bend, then I might not break. I should think about giving in. If I bend, then I might be okay if I think about how it ends. It was not until after Scott's death that I realized, at least to me, that lines like these, coupled with imagery of an overpass and jumping, that the song was about contemplating suicide, a, a literal leap off the edge. Being in a state of such frazzled, chaotic mental noise that you want to throw punches off the ledge and bend to your most terrifying impulses for the sake of remaining whole in some sense. Breaking in this song, to me anyway, uh, is not death, but remaining alive and allowing the suffering to intensify. Bending is making the leap for the sake of the peace beneath the roar of the bridge. Thinking about how it ends, where ending is the only guarantee of freedom. And that's super, super dark, I realize. Um, but I have to be honest and say that that's how I feel when I listen to it. Um, but I recognize that, again, as with so many of Scott's songs, the writing is sufficiently uh, layered and dimensional and intentionally so as to not point you at a particular interpretation and to deliberately allow that variety um, to exist. It's what is a staple of all the greatest songwriters. Um, neither is more true or nor less true, um, if it's how you feel. Uh, I, I had nearly left the campus at this point. Um, many of the brightest lights were behind me. It seemed proper that I crossed another bridge at this point as the song Blood Under the Bridge began to play. Uh, this is a song that immediately acquired a strong significance to me. It captures turmoil in relationships, the very real physical scars that can be left behind from mutual emotional violence. Put down the knife and watch the blood under the bridge go by. Hear the twisting of the phrase water under the bridge to represent hurt inflicted in a relationship washing away in its aftermath, or at least the desire for it to wash away. As in, there is a fragment of light, but it's hiding in the distance. The second verse here has some of my favorite lines on the album, pure Scott-isms that are as wryly funny as they are dark and poignant. So tie your ragged fuck-ups in a neat little knot and put it on the shelf behind the picture we bought. I found a way to make the best of a floor and realize it's not the end, it's an uncomfortable pause. That last line was the lyric I chose to send to Scott beneath the tweet that would ultimately prove to be, seemingly, his suicide note to the world at a time when he was just missing and his body had not yet been found. I, like many fans, hoped he would see what I had written his own words in this instance, to know that something he created had value and was loved, and through it that he was loved, even if that didn't help for the chance that it could, I had to try. Uh, it was midway through 400 Bones that I arrived at the hospital, and I decided to stop the album and finish it later. The hospital visit, uh, was an arduous and dull affair, which is probably a good thing. Uh, whatever had happened was fortunately not serious, um, but we sat in the waiting room for hours, killing time through cheap conversation uh, and scrolling aimless, aimlessly. I knew I did not want to finish the album here. It, it must have been sometime between 2 and 3 a.m. that I arrived home, slid out of my clothes and into bed, and decided to finish the album in one fell swoop. Though I'd heard a part of it earlier, in my frazzled state and hospital-bound glide, I'd not really absorbed much of the song that I was on, so I was startled by how immediately the minor key piano lead melody struck me. 
400 Bones is the best song on this album and one of the most emotionally poignant songs about love ever written. Though slow in pace, there is immediately an urgency and emotional heft to the melody and the opening line, which is also the song's closing line, feels show-stopping and sharp. 400 bones, crumpled in bed. I'm the only one who knows that you're still breathing. The song essentially captures a post-coital moment, lyrically, but renders the urgency of the connection in the wake of it as deathly dramatic. Beneath the blanket of another French death, French death presumably being a reference to La Petite Mort, the origin, the orgasm thing, um, this afternoon is one I will be keeping. The emotional climax of the song is its cresting, powerful bridge, which I have to quote in full because it is simply some of the best writing in a song ever and maybe my favorite lyrical passage that Scott ever wrote. This is my safe house in the hurricane. Here is where my love lay, 200 treasured bones. This is my warmth behind the Cold War. This is what I'm living for, forever coming home. Here's to the room I can rest in, the door I'll always open, never to be closed. You as my horizon line, the star I navigate by, takes me back to hold 200 perfect bones. Ultimately, the kinetic emotional energy summoned in the delivery of these lines is paired back for a stark and startling finale, which reveals these words for the fantasy that they are. A dream of home that seems likely in the wake of death, in a similar vein to the record's opening song. On absent days, I will return to this place and play a silent color film within my head, in which the pillow leaves a code upon your face and all at once, it all makes perfect sense. If I were ever unsure that Scott and the band could write and perform another song as heart-stopping, as perfect in its sheer and simple beauty as State Hospital was, this was it. Lying in my bed, I felt the tears streaming down my cheeks. This was the first time I had cried since hearing Death Dream that day in the car. The feeling on that day of being lost in a tangle of connection I was desperately trying to unweave, of not lingering on the harm and of resolving to move forward, all came flooding back. I did not know then that I would soon have another 200 treasured bones beside me. So for a while, I taught myself to treasure my own, to be my own safe house in the hurricane to live for forever coming home, regardless of what home was or how it would look. Lump Street returns to the storytelling mode of pedestrian verse with a gloomy pulsing keyboard that recalls band friends and other favorites of mine, The Twilight Sad, and a story that does recall a state hospital in some respects, though more sprawling than that, examining a neighborhood where everyone is connected by their suffering. Once again, as is often the case in Scott's writing, sex is violent, relationships are fraught, and trust is complicated, violated. Do you want more unshapely love? However, in a thrilling twist, the dour minor key first half of the song erupts halfway through into something uplifting, fast-paced and explosive, an adrenaline rush, the likes of which seldom occur on this record. I mean, I can't put it more perfectly than the beautiful way that Jake described this song. Um, as the guitars crest and, and burn bright, Scott urges either himself or the song's characters, or both, to get it together now, find hope. There is life beyond the one you already know. I think it's genuinely one of the most cathartic moments in all of their songs, and it provides a thrilling climax to the record. 
I, I die like a rich boy ends the final frightened rabbit record on a plaintive acoustic note. It is one of Scott's most moving songs, and as with many of his record finales, it serves as a show-stopping and heartbreaking goodbye. I genuinely can't even attempt to try and describe this song uh, because Jake just did it so perfectly. Uh, it's a rare song, and Sersha contributed beautiful insights as well. Both of you just described this song amazingly. Uh, it's a rare song where every single lyric is perfect and moving and devastating and iconic, all in equal measure. In many respects, it may be the most perfectly distilled expression Scott ever laid to tape of anything. I, I don't even have anything to add about it. It is simply a flawless song. The tears shed over 400 bones flowed yet again and lying in my bed in the early hours of my 19th birthday, I sat in perfect silence as the record ended, soaking in the experience of a wearying, lengthy night that began and ended with this special work. I won't pretend it was an instant favorite. There were certainly songs that took their time to grow on me and seep beneath my skin, so to speak. Scott's death in 2018 certainly lended this record in particular an additional gravitas that it has retained with time. Uh, it doesn't have the most consistently staggering song craft of all of their albums, but all the sentiments are perfectly and wonderfully expressed as ever, and I wouldn't change a single element of any of these songs, nor would I remove any. As the band's first and only album with no interludes and simply 12 fantastic songs, it is among their most holistically well-crafted and complete statements. And it stands as a shining beacon to their song craft and in particular to Scott's wonderful way with words. Oh, and I want to add something about that cover, an additional piece of context that, that Jake didn't mention. It's an image of the Kola Super Deep Borehole, which is a Russian oil drilling structure that is responsible for creating and maintaining the deepest man-made point beneath the surface of the earth. Yeah, that's all I have to say. Oh, you're all so good. Mm. We did it, guys. We did we it. We did do it. Oh, um, so, yeah, shout out also to the bonus tracks on this album. <laughs> oh, my God, yes. So can, we, can we talk about The Wreck for a second? Oh. Because this, like, genuinely, if this was a part of the album proper and this was actually the closer, I would still not mind because this is a song. It was like when I first listened to Circles by Mac Miller and was struck by how poignant every lyric felt as if he had written it from beyond the grave and i can't think of a better example of a song that feels like it was written from beyond the grave than that one it is the, the wreck is basically like listening to him and his partner from uh the the last song at the bottom of a lake singing about exactly what you think they would be and it's mm -hmm. one of the most beautiful songs they've ever made I completely agree, and I'm so thrilled that there's another person shouting it out. It's one of my favorite um, non-album tracks of theirs. I just, the moment it starts, it starts so softly, so mm -hmm. softly. It's like waking up from a dream, and I just, there's something about the timbre of it. There's something about the sound of the song that just yeah. makes me weep. Like, it's just so affecting, and it's so soft and understated. I can see why they left it off the album. But it is a mm -hmm. beautiful, beautiful, beautiful song. And, and emerging into it from Die Like a Rich Boy is, is a, hell of a, a hell of an experience. And the other two B-sides are great as well. Wait Till the Morning yeah. is superb. And so is A Lick of Paint. Um, Lick of good Paint songs. is terrific. Uh, yeah. So we were, tr we were truly blessed by this band. Every single thing um, from Midnight Organ Fight onwards is just a treasure. Um, and we're so lucky to have ah oh, we're so lucky to have all of these songs yeah. i mean rare are is it that bands are this remarkably consistent <laughs> but rare are bands this remarkably consistent with some very sharp 
very poignant, very niche material mm. that like requires grueling self-examination yeah. and genuine pain to express. Like the fact that they were able to accomplish their discography is one of the most impressive achievements in the medium of music. Mm. I would, like, I would suggest that the fact that we've all felt comfortable going to places we've gone to on this episode should be a testament to the bar set by the music itself. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, shall we do our favourite tricks and ratings? Um, can, can I rate it last, if that's you, okay? You can do that yeah. if you want. Yeah. Um, but I um, do. <laughs> <laughs> Jake, do you want to go first? Yeah, sure. Well, my number one is a tie between Die Like a Rich Boy and Death Dream. I'm not picking between the two because you can't fucking make me. Uh, <laughs> second is Woke Up Hurting, which is a song I slightly glazed over, but I would just like to say as someone I, I alluded to not being able to get out of, of bed in, in high school occasionally, and there is no song that better captures that feeling of stillness than Woke Up Hurting does, and the fact that it still manages to be inspiring is fucking incredible. Like, I, it's, it's a miracle of a song. It's, a, it's also like, it's a bop. <laughs> Yeah, it's absolute. like, you want to sing along to it, and it's just like, fuck, maybe I do want to get up. Jesus Christ. Yes, <laughs> and, yes, exactly. And uh, then, I would say, it's so fucking hard, because I've got three in my extra ones in my top 25, but the last one I'll mention is An Otherwise Disappointing Life. And my least favorite song, once again, for the third time in a row, does not exist. But if it could exist even less than the other two, it exists even less here, as I can't even come up with a hypothetical complaint of a single note in the arrangement of this entire 40-minute record. And it gets maybe the hardest 10 I could ever issue in my life. Oh, we love to see it so much. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, my three favorite tricks are 400 Bones, Blood Under the Bridge, and Chinese, I mean, uh, I mean, <laughs> Death Dream. <laughs> Thank you for that. I needed to, I needed oh, to come back. Can you give me my second <laughs> wind? Yeah. Was, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, oh. Least favorite track is uh, Get Fucked. Uh, and Love that song. Uh, yeah. Uh, working <laughs> title for the second track on the album. Um, um, <laughs> um, yeah. So, wow. uh, yeah, it gets a 10. Wow. That is impressive. Um, I there was a spider on me. Oh dear. Um, um, my top three tracks are probably Death Dream, um, Bad Under the Bridge, and Die Like a Rich Boy. I'm sad I couldn't get 400 bones in there. Like yeah, we same. sound a we, we sound a French New Wave referencing King. Um, <laughs> and my. I don't have a least favorite track, and I'm giving this record a ten out of ten. Let's go! Let's fucking go! Don't say me. You know, and l let me just throw this out there too for for viewers at home, because I know that like when we do B sides, <laughs> especially, and when we do recommended albums. Of course, we are predisposed to, at least with like half of them, to, to like shower them with praise because we want to talk about them. Mm -hmm. That said, there are maybe three other bands in existence that have earned more than two 10 out of 10s from me consecutively. And yeah. you, that, that's, that's a difficult fucking thing to, to, to undertake with me to in part with how uh, impressive you should think that is. Yeah, so, and, and just to hammer home um, the point, um, the only other, there have only been four other albums that we've done that have gotten all 10 out of 10s, and that is Ride the Lightning, Home Like No Place There Is, um, A Storm in Heaven, and Carry and Lull. Oh, we've done a lot of records. Elite it's choices from the podcast. It's good company, yeah. All right, so uh, Panic, of a Panic of a Panic Attack released in 2016. Uh, so let's kind of continue on the story. Uh, in 2017, 
uh, the band released an EP, uh, their last EP, uh, called Recorded Songs. Great title. Um, and it has <laughs> As three, opposed to the unrecorded ones. <laughs> it has uh, three songs on it. Roadless, How It Gets In, which features Julian Baker and uh, Rained On. Um, three superb songs kind of hinted a more kind of po- even more polished and, and poppier direction than painting, which would have been interesting to see them pursue. Uh, but there are three great songs in and of themselves, uh, particularly Rain Dawn, which I really love. Um, beautiful kind of five minute driving song. Uh, well worth checking out. Uh, and then I'm not exactly sure when this happened, but I think it was early in 2018 that uh, Frightened Rabbit released as a kind of standalone single the song No Real Life, uh, which uh, I believe is the final um, officially released Frightened Rabbit song. Uh, it is beautiful. Um, it's, I can't, it's gorgeous. It's so sad. <laughs> it's what? amazing. It's gorgeous. It's, it's beautiful. Um, I've wept to it many times. Uh, one of their most underrated B-sides. Go and listen to it if you haven't heard it already. Stunning song, No Real Life. Um, yeah, anyway, and then, so, uh, and at some point, uh, Scott and Grant, um, the brothers in Frightened Rabbit teamed up with, um, Justin Lockie of the band Editors and also the, uh, other indie rock supergroup Minor Victories, which have one album that I very strongly recommend, um, that's kind of post Rocky um, which features a Rachel Goswell of slow dive. Anyway. Uh, so Justin Lockie of editors and minor victories and his, and his brother, James Lockie joined up with Scott and Grant. Uh, they played guitar and bass respectively to form a new band uh, uh, called master system. Uh, yes, and my, they my really question f- is, is minor victories what you get after, after defeating the minor threat? sure uh and so (laughs) they released they released an album uh under this master system name called dance music uh it was released on the 6th of april 2018 almost two years to the day after a painting of a panic attack um uh, and even though it's an understated and underappreciated release they did do uh, there are, are quite a few interviews and live performances that do exist of this band so there's definitely a record of their existence uh, more than you might think it's more it goes more than just the album um but this is the album does contain all of the original material that the band produced i think at least that they've released anyway uh and so the album's called dance music uh it's yeah um uh, okay so does anyone have a strong desire to go first on this um i mean i mean i can if you want i to think go i first, might go, go i think i might go last just because i suspect okay. i have a, maybe a bit more to say than than you two, i right? undoubtedly mm-hmm. would guess that you but, have at least yeah. more than me to say okay yeah cool. i mean I i'd like to go last my, then yeah i mean what i have to say is kind of holistic and uh uh, it covers everything I want to say, but it's not Ito. massive. Um, so this album, I think it kind of brings the post-punky trajectory that the band was taking to its logical conclusion and then past that into a thick, heavy, shoegazy, fuzzy, energetic rock music. Um, and just that I was not expecting the level of fuzz on this album. Um which is why songs. I kind of wanted you to, guys to listen to it so much because it is so different yeah. that I yeah. think it's, it's kind of a nice, fresh yeah. look at it. It's at, no at it. Owl John. Like, this is a definitive progression. Like, it's a, yes. it gives you a, a sense of a new possibility. that, could, that Absolutely. That, yeah. that, uh, and I just really want to say, I, I want to make no bones about this. I really fucking like this record <laughs> so much. Um, and with the exception of one song that I'll get onto, I engage with it on a very different level to what Frightened Rabbit do. The lyrics are great, but I engage with this much more as a visceral piece of propulsive music. Um, the exception is the closing track, um, Bird, The Bird is Border Flying, which is a song you can't listen to and avoid the lyrics. Um, which are so very poignant and potent and beautiful. It has these beautiful images of a bird flying so high it realizes the Earth's aloneness in the universe and feeling disillusioned with its own 
ability, you know, which of course is um, probably a very personal al allegory for for emotional growth. Um, you know, you have this lyric, um, what is it? Um, Everyone wants the fire until it burns, um, which is particularly uh, <laughs> um, aggressively attacking and sad. Um, I, then again, the, I also really like the song Must Try Harder. Again, a beautiful solo, some great lyrics, really lovely chorus. I think I have a tab open with the chorus up here somewhere. A brace, brace, I must try harder in every way to embrace the change with grace we'll see. There is no such thing as pathetic empathy. I'm still learning how to be, um, which is beautiful chorus. So amazing. Yeah, so amazingly Best. gorgeous. Um, yeah, an old team. The one big lyric that comes through is the repeated one. One last try, I'll get it right. Um, yeah, this... I, I, I mean, there. I, I wish I had more music that sounded like this from these artists. Um, just God. I mean, look. And any time you you throw like good accessible alt rock with a huge fuzzy pedal on it at me, I'm gonna respond to that. Um, and it's just a really beautifully put together, very energetic. Lots of um, drumming's on the ones and threes, which gives it a really propulsive energy to it. Um, um, yeah, I think what makes it so satisfying is that it's a realization that um, the urgency of, of what Scott does and how he writes and how he sings um, is a perfect match for this in a way that you kind of never imagine. You never think about it, but as soon as you hear it, you realize, yeah. holy shit, this was made, mm -hmm. this kind of music was made to like, this head, yeah. this is, yeah. Yeah, head like imagine imagine if 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 there are those stages to this if the pixies had written late march death march and it was then covered by queens of the stone age <laughs> that sounds fucking awesome yeah no i, I see yeah. that totally yeah well that's what the record sounds like to me um and i love it to pieces <laughs> yes. mm -hmm. yeah yeah it's definitely like uh uh, it's grown on me a lot, as I'll talk about. But yeah, nice. Okay. Well, I want to hear what Jake thinks. I, I already kind of know what Jake thinks, but I don't want to hear him yeah. say it. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, there's no uh, dissident here. I mean, well, I'm not straying from the group opinion. We've almost had perfectly aligning thoughts, despite what our <laughs> specific scores might differ from. I'm pretty sure we've all kind of gone with mm. the grain. And yeah, it's not exactly changing. Uh, this album <laughs> just kind of fucking rules. Um, I love first first thing about it. I I maybe it's me at my fucking old age of twenty two, but uh, it's short. It's thirty five minutes. It's nine songs long, and I appreciate that it maintains a a balance of not feeling like it is scant or slight, but it also doesn't overstay its welcome. I feel like Frightened Rabbit albums are tailored to being 10 to 15 minutes longer than this because they just contain a bit of a wider palette, a more spacious sound, whereas this is more aggressive and just kind of effusive and, and just, it, it has so much energy, like the fuzz. The fuzz cannot be understated. The fuzz is, the fuzz is God here. <laughs> um, I mean, like, from proper home on, you're just kind of like, oh, shit, all right. Like, I mean, this is good blast in your car music. Um, there are a few select moments where it does feel like the sound and Scott's vocals clash a bit, not in like a, not even necessarily in a bad way, but it just sort of feels like Scott is like adjusting to this style and trying to keep up with the song that's happening. I think I felt that particularly on uh, the enlightenment and teething. That said, not a particularly large complaint. I think the actual sound of the record is really satisfying. It's really textured. It's really layered. It's really heavy. Like this is, this is a lot fucking heavier than anything Frightened Rabbit did. It's like, it's, it's an order of magnitude different, but in spirit, it's a lot of the same stuff. Um, a very dark album, too. Um, I don't want to give the impression that I, like, 
th- this isn't as good as the Frightened Rabbit stuff, because I genuinely think that it is. It's just that uh, I feel like I need to go on a more lengthy journey with this record. Um, I feel I want it to grow on me a little bit more, even though I already would say I kind of love it. But I am waiting for it to, I suppose, fully click with me. And the just because I think Frightened Rabbit as an act was just so immediately my shit. And it's just like, this is just, it's a different flavor of my shit. And I like it, but it's like, you know, it, it's not exactly the path I always travel down. It's like, oh, hey, you want Frightened Rabbit if it sounded like Idol's first record? And it's like, uh, I mean, yeah, yeah, I would like that. What do you, why would you ask me this? What, get out of my house. And I think that this album too, like, it's weird just because I do find a lot of optimism on something even as like bleak as Painting of a Panic Attack. But here, in this 35 minute span, there is deep emotional darkness that does not feel quite as hopeful and I think that makes it slightly difficult for me especially I mean like when the last song on here is Bird is Bored of Flying which is absolutely 100% one of the best songs Scott or anyone involved with the band was was ever a part of it is a heartbreaking song that just like I mean you'll know it and once the lyric you know he never asked to be born fucking pops up and you're just like oh fuck's sake man i can't do this shit <laughs> and uh it's it, it, it's tough to reconcile i i won't lie like it makes visiting this album as short as it is and as lean and as all killer no filler and as confident as it is it does struggle and i feel like that struggle is going to get easier with time but as is this is the frightened well not frightened rabbit record but the the one of the records we talked about today yeah this is the album with scott's that i am most excited to evolve and grow with because i want to see where it takes me because i feel like i've only scratched the surface in a way it feels kind of like pedestrian verse in that sense is that i go and listen to that and i'm just like wow i feel like i'm getting something new each time and the three times i listened to this i was just kind of like yeah i feel there's there is definitely something here that i feel was you know worth pursuing i'm just very glad it's kind of like al john in that respect i'm just glad they explored this avenue of this sound and that we get to have it and so we don't, we aren't left wondering what something like this could have been or could have sounded like. I would have, of course, loved to see the sound expanded upon. But if this is the the final notes to go out on, it is a triumphant one artistically. I M O. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Uh, definitely, um, this record uh, took time more so than the other records to really fully. For me to connect with it the, to the extent that I do, although the fact that it was released in such close proximity to Scott's death, like literally a month before he died, uh, this came out. Uh, it, 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 it tethered it to that particular moment for me in a, in a very yeah. strong way. Um, but yeah, the title Dance Music is a cheeky title that belies a base of raucous, loud and aggressive guitar work that elevates Scott's ever urgent and psychologically hard hitting songwriting. Uh, the writing here is more personal than ever, uh, less guarded, less dressed up. It essentially reads like a poetic stream of conscious almost diary entry style reflection on Scott's mindset at the time. Uh, What makes it particularly meaningful though, is obviously the context that it has acquired after the fact. Uh, It seems fair to say that these are fairly unguarded insights into the mind of someone slowly losing their tether to the world and falling through a pit of despair. It's not to say, that's not to say that this is interesting purely as a curio in that way. If you're a fan of Scott, you'll find this extra piece of connection to him outside of Frightened Rabbit to be bittersweet and important, as I think the two of you have kind of suggested. But ultimately, it's difficult to avoid his preoccupation across the writing of this record with death, reflection, saying goodbye, and wrestling to find the strength not to give up ultimately flailing for a foothold that he could not find 
uh, in many ways to me, it's an even harder listen in this respect than painting of a panic attack. Proper Home opens the record in an immediately jarring and gripping fashion with a hooky, melodic, serrated guitar, courtesy of Justin, and Scott mournfully intoning, I used to want to fly, but now I don't. I can't count the number of times that I have thrown this album on in my car and immediately started pumping my fist on the roof, screaming along and blaring that cathartic guitar at dangerous volume. Notes on a life not quite lived. Lot to unpack at that title alone. Um, yeah, it was the well, project. on the record. It was the project's lead single. Uh, it was a little more subdued, though still with a heavy and blaring chorus. Uh, it's also worth noting the stellar production of this project. It gives it real punch and impact to all players involved, almost in like a garage rock style. Um, Grant's drums have never sounded as brutal as they do here. And oh, it's great. The drumming is just mm. insane on this thing. And, Fantastic. And, and Justin reveals a talent for noisy and scuzzy riffs that is seldom realized in his uh, work with editors. Uh, these words won't shatter the earth. Hope is born of hopelessness, Scott sings. And though this record did remain cruelly underappreciated, Scott's own modesty and seeming inability to fully grasp the effect and positive impact his music had is likely the reason why so many people, myself included, turned to remind him when he first disappeared. The Enlightenment is just a fantastic, explosive punk song intended as a tribute from Scott to the family and friends who had supported him through his most painful moments, and in retrospect, an attempt to tell them not to blame themselves for what would happen. You made a difference. Few songs thread the line between being so plaintively moving and just fucking banging as hard as this one does. It's definitely grown to be a favorite of mine. The slow build of teething switches up the pace of the record for something more tense and still very emotional. Scott stretches out that word in the line, I'm still teething, to an uncomfortable extent, almost making it sound pained so that the suffering it represents can fully come across to the listener. Existing in a state of constant aching in the in-between, never fully formed, waiting for some improvement to be realized that never seems to come. The steady build of the song eventually explodes in its conclusion to a floodgate burst of melodic noise. Like seriously, the ending of the song is insane. Uh, it's incredibly cathartic and it just justifies the five minute runtime beautifully. Old Team is even better. Uh, Old Team is the song that Scott said was his favorite on this record. And it seems another of many autobiographical tracks, this time reflecting on his progression and role as a musician among his friends and bandmates. The days when we were full of it have died. One last time I might get it right. I couldn't count or even estimate the number of times that I have barreled down the highway, screaming along to old team, nobody fuck with me, old team six month losing streak. Uh, incidentally as well, the song has a beautiful music video that features um, footage from the brief time that Master System toured in the month before Scott's death uh, that was edited into a tribute to him after the fact that I strongly recommend checking out. Beautiful video. Uh, the record gives a final glimmer of hope in the song Must Try Harder, in which Scott resolves himself to try and embrace the change. Uh, and in the heartbreaking bridge, he asserts... I'm not there yet, but I'll try to reset to a kinder, cleaner, better version of myself. A Waste of Daylight is really difficult to listen to, to be honest. It's a painfully yeah. recognizable screed of self-loathing uh, with plenty of lines that hit with a pang of retrospective tragedy. Uh, for example, I missed the summer, but didn't care. There will always be another if I make it to next year. Finally, we get Bird is Bored of Flying. Uh, I'm certainly, yeah. I know I'm certainly projecting a bit if I imagine this record as a kind of last gasp suicide note. 
Uh, I'll never know if Scott was truly suicidal while writing it or if his death was the result of something sudden and unexpected. Um, But this song to me has always seemed a tacit acknowledgement that the end was not only near, but inevitable. Uh, It is one of the most potent, unrestrained, and powerful expressions of total defeat that I have ever seen in art. It is one of my favorite songs of all time. It somehow manages to sound both defeated and triumphant, with that resounding, career-best melody rising through the darkness like some creature taking flight before in the song's climax, the melody collapses from the weight of the noise around it. And you genuinely feel that fall, that embrace of the ground, that freeing leap into emptiness, the end of pain at last. It's tragic, it's heartbreaking, uh, but it's truthful to that feeling. If you ever, for whatever reason, need to explain suicidality to someone who doesn't quite understand it. It's hard for me to imagine listening to this song and coming away confused. Scott expresses it through one of his most straightforward metaphors in a career of frequently dense ones. Do you wonder why the bird is bored of flying? It never asked to be alive, to be a bird that never cared for heights. There's a real release and frankly freedom in the way that Scott begs, shoot it down, pull the wings out, I am waiting. It's a dour and devastating moment to end a lifetime of songwriting on, but what it does show is Scott's desire to help others understand. And I think what we can learn from it is a better understanding of how it feels to exist at your lowest so that you may recognize it in yourself and others and hopefully keep close to the ground, wings abreast, for the possibility of better that Scott never experienced, but that does exist. I know because I've been in exactly the state the song portrays, and I've been fortunate enough to find a way through it. Not everyone is. But until we understand it, we are powerless to become victims of ourselves. When Scott died on the 10th of May, 2018, my partner and I got in the car and we drove around all night long, listening to all of these albums and hollering along. I won't say it felt spiritual, and I won't say even that it eased the devastation we were experiencing. But for once, I was reminded of all the times I had spent with Scott through these records. All of the joy and pain and catharsis that they had brought me. And I realized that they would outlive all of us. And that we were simply lucky enough to have them at our side at this time, at this place, breathing. When the final record finished on that long drive, we stared at each other and knew we were here. And we were glad to be. If not for ourselves, then at least to carry the memory on, to ensure the music reached others, and to celebrate a life not quite lived. Beautiful as always, Tyler. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Made it. Yeah, I like it's a special did. record. Uh, it, it is a difficult <laughs> one to end this journey on, so I wanted to try and give it the the beauty that it deserves i think the gravitas yeah. no absolutely yeah, I, and i'm glad that you guys dig this record as well i have no idea why this is so slept on <laughs> yeah i mean like look i'm not gonna say like it is often a shame when an artist dies and that's when a lot of people get into their music sure mm-hmm. it's 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 a weird thing and i'm not even saying that that's good or bad it's just weird But, like, if any record deserved to have attention put onto it, why not this one? I just, it's it's so fully formed and so what it is, I just feel like this should be something that is, like, it, it wouldn't be, like, 
just sort of like a cult thing that like you would look at as being like, wow, this has a really high rate your music score. I've never heard of this before. And then you find out that it's fucking amazing. Yeah. <laughs> like, I just don't, I don't get it. What, what is the right your music score of this album? I uh, think it's too low, cursed. probably. I think it's like 3.3 or something. 3.35. Uh, let's see. What is well, on, oh on Sputnik? It's criminal. I don't remember what yeah, the, exactly the, it is. The but... rate your music ratings of Frightened Rabbit in general are pretty fucking pitiful, uh, to be honest. Yeah, what does Midnight Organ Fight have? That's a good, that has 3.64, which is pretty good for, for okay. the website. Uh, that has a four point, like three on here which is great yeah mm -hmm. yeah but i think people are, yeah. are more people are discovering them like when i go through youtube videos of their music videos that consistently all the time without fail in the comments there's someone saying i am so sad that i discovered this uh artist after this their way. death. Um, yeah. but i'm also glad that i have discovered this artist and so it's, exactly. it's, it's beautiful to me to see that that people are still being drawn to their music for the first time uh as yeah. You have been Jake long after um, the project has, has yeah. ceased to be. And I do hope that someday we get to, uh, the band have kind of hinted that someday, it may be a long time in the future, or it may not happen at all, but someday they may release the demos that they had been working on for their uh, follow-up to Painting of a Panic Attack. So maybe someday we'll see those maybe. in some form. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, but Master no. System, dance music. Let's do our favorite tracks and ratings. Yeah, let's sure. go. Um, so, um, gems, gems and tea order. Yeah, sure. Jake. Not... All right. Uh, my three favorite tracks are as follows. We have notes on a life not quite lived bird is bored of flying and must try harder. Least favorite. Uh, I'll say teething. Not a bad song. Just, you know, and a uh, strong eight. Cool. Nice. Right. Um, I'm going to say Proper Home, um, Must Try Harder, and Bird is Border Flying are my favorites. If I had to pick a least favorite, I'd probably say um, whatever the eighth track was. The name escapes me. Um, Wasted Daylight. Thank you. It's still good, but you know, I'm going to give this record an eight and a half out cool. of ten. Uh, my three favorite tracks are Bird is Border Flying, Old Team, and uh i'll pick teething no 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 i'll pick the enlightenment as my third favorite track because that song bobs mm -hmm. and slaps uh i do mm -hmm. think there is one track on the record that i find inessential i didn't talk about it it's fine but it's peaks and troughs and graves which is good but doesn't quite have the the feeling of essential writing that the others do uh, but it's a great album i'm going to give it uh, a nine out of ten very very good um, yeah eight and a half yeah. very respectable it deserves it god um cool okay so one thing i want to shout out before we move on to our favorite tracks list uh last year uh a, a pro a special project was released called um tiny changes a yes. celebration of uh, the midnight organ fight and so what this project was was it was um it was a compilation of covers that a bunch of different artists did for every song on the Midnight Organ Fight to celebrate. It was yeah. initially planned, I think, to celebrate that record's 10 year anniversary. Uh, and then of course it, it adopted an additional significance following yeah. Scott's passing. So um, it's, it's very good. It, uh, yeah, very, it's, it's fucking like, if you are a fan, essential listening yeah. i yeah. want to shout out some of the covers on it um very briefly julian so, baker's cover of modern Ma leper julian, is amazing julian baker's cover of modern leaping is amazing and it, she just thoroughly julian bakerizes the song uh yep. biffy clyro also do an awesome cover of that song as well mm -hmm. that is very biffy clyro in a good in a good way <laughs> yes uh, it was um it, yeah super good i'm glad uh, we can compliment them on this podcast yeah yes. right <laughs> <laughs> i really dug uh I won't go into all the covers, but ones I particularly dug for the way that they changed the songs, as I really dug, uh, there was a cover of the song Fast Blood that really turned it into like a proper punk banger that I really dug. Uh, there's a full-on countrified version of Old Old Fashion that's quite cool. Mm -hmm. um, I also want to shout out uh, Ben Gibbard of Deep 
Ca- Death, Death Cab, Cab for Cutie, Cutie. covered Keep mm-hmm. Yourself Warm and turned it into a, a late period Diff Cab song, which sounds great. Um, the band Daughter, the indie band Daughter, not to be confused with Daughters. Um, <laughs> yeah, definitely not. The band Daughter did a fantastic cover of Poke that I really adore. It's gorgeous. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, Manchester Orchestra did a superb yes. cover of My Backwards mm-hmm. World. Uh, Fucking amazing. And my favorite cover of all time. Oh, yeah. Uh, and this is so on brand. But not only is it my favorite <laughs> cover of all time, it's legitimately, if you asked me to pick the most devastating piece of music I'd ever heard, it would be this. And it is, <laughs> yeah. um, it is the Twilight Sads cover of Floating in the Fourth. Um, if, and, and for context, uh, Twilight Sad singer James Graham was a close friend of Scott's. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and it, it just seems um, inevitable and right that they would be the band to cover this particular song because of that relationship. Uh, it's a difficult listen. I'm not going to lie. It's, it's, it's rough. It's really rough. It's, it turns it into a kind of very haunting post-punky industrial song that's kind of similar to what they were doing on No One Can Ever Know, I think. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, it's, a very, it's just, be warned, it's, it's tough. Mm-hmm. It's, it's really tough, but it's a great cover. And just generally, yeah. the, the oh, another thing I want to shout out about the compilation is that they take the interludes, Bright Pink Bookmark and Extra Super Very, and they actually flesh them out into full-fledged songs, which I think was a cool thing mm. uh, that the original record didn't do and, and is a nice little advantage of this record too. So yeah, shout out to that compilation. Uh, pr- the proceeds from that compilation went towards a charity in Scott's name um, called the Tiny Changes Charity, I believe. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and yeah, it's, it's superb and worth checking out. Uh, oh, another little curio I want to shout out as well. Uh, I don't think this song has been released in any official capacity, but this was quite interesting. So, uh, there's a song called Break in the Clouds, um, a Frightened Rabbit song called Break in the Clouds that was never released officially, uh, nor was it ever alluded to at any point, but it showed up during the end credits of you'll never guess you'll you know if i gave you a million guesses as to a movie in the last couple of years that a random frightened rabbit song that no one has it's gonna ever be something heard before. fucking stupid like i am legend or something no like yeah, yeah it's very something stupid but something recent <laughs> so uh so this song breaking the clouds which i haven't which i've only heard in, in a rip from this credits and um, but it's beautiful and very um painting of a panic attack esque with an anthemic chorus and stuff uh and it showed up at the end credits of the Dwayne Johnson vehicle Skyscraper. <laughs> what? I know, right? What? And like, no Fucking one what? No one knew this song existed until one Frightened Rabbit fan happened to see the movie. And, that, and they're like, well, hang on. That, that, hang on. Wait what, is, what is the Venn diagram percentage for people who went to see Skyscraper and stayed for the credits and people who are having fans? Like, like, I, the... I saw Skyscraper in cinemas. I should have picked up on that. It was like, not even like, it was like, I think it was like the last song in the credits as well. So it was like, that's no one, amazing. no one. Amazing. But anyway, um, yeah, so shout out to that song, which is really good. I hope it gets officially released at some point. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, so basically, that's where we're at. Yeah. Um, so let's, I mean, let's wrap guys, this shit up. Do you guys want to do an album ranking? I don't know if I want to do an album ranking. I, I mean, will, I mean, because I if, I said, if, I, if I said I didn't have a ranking, I'd be lying. Okay, well, so. let's, do, let's do rankings then. Why don't you guys do your rankings yeah. first? No, yeah. And my, I think my, it goes my... without saying that the records are really just ordered in how much they mean to us. That's really yeah. it. Yeah, that that's like, so very true. Yeah, here more than ever. Yeah, um, my list of songs are not ordered at all, though, because you can't okay. make me. Well, let's do the album um, ranking first, and then we'll go around and do yeah. the songs. Yeah. yeah. Okay, Jake, okay. your album ranking. Album ranking. Well, of all the inc- things we discussed we, today, yeah, of all the things we are including. Let's see here. We have in how many albums are we covering Seven. in total? Seven. Okay. So in seventh place, we will, of course, have Sing the Greys. Uh, in sixth place, we will have Owl John. Uh, in fifth place, we will have... 
In fifth place, I'll have Yeah, Master System. And in fourth place, we'll have the Midnight Organ Fight. Third place, the Winter of Mixed Drinks. Second place, Pedestrian Verse. First place, Painting of a Panic Attack. Fear. And obviously, okay. for our viewers, this is a silly exercise that we do for fun. It doesn't mean anything. <laughs> no, um, fucking, yeah. who cares? Yeah. Uh, so sure. Yeah. All right. Sing the Greys at the bottom. I wasn't intending to include the other albums because it's a frightened rabbit episode, but I'll do it anyway. Um, so Sing the Greys at the bottom, and then Owl John, then Winter Mixed Drinks, and then Dance Music, and then the. Uh, sorry, I got my order wrong. After Owl John, it's Pedestrian Verse, and then it's Dance Music, and then it's Winter Mixed Drinks. Then it's painting with panic attack, and then it's uh, the midnight organ fight. That's my favorite Frightened Rabbit album. Okay, awesome. For me, uh, seventh place is Sing the Greys, uh, sixth place is Owl John, uh, fifth place is Dance Music, and then the top four. Fuck this, I hate <laughs> this. Uh, fourth place, I'll put uh. Guess winter of mixed drinks, third place, midnight organ fight, and then I'm going to tie the first two pedestrian verse and painting because fuck it. Yeah. All right, let's do our favorite songs now. Um, so oh boy. I said that you could do a top 20, you don't have to. I think, Sersha, you said you were just happy with 10. Yeah, I'm, I'm still doing my 10. Okay, well, I'll let you go first then. Yeah, okay, so in no particular order, I have uh, Death Dream, Die Like a Rich Boy. Late March, Death March, State Hospital, Swim Until You Can't See Land, Floating in the Fourth, uh, My Backwards Walk, Keep Yourself Warm, Old Old Fashioned, and The Modern Leper. Can you tell what my favorite Frightened Rabbit record is? Sersha, I'm not going to lie. Our lists are like 70% similar in top 10. <laughs> <laughs> All right, then, Jake, why don't, why don't you go next? Uh, I did a top 25 because fuck you, I can... <laughs> <laughs> no okay no one's okay. stopping you this is like i i just had to include one after and then i i just i had to make room so mm -hmm. 25 notes on a life quite not quite lived 24 the loneliness 23 lump street 22 stupid boy 21 still want to be here 20 living in color 19 things 18 Swim Until You Can't See Land, 17, The Oil Slick, 16, Cold Creeps, 15, Poke, 14, Bird is Bored of Flying, 13, Acts of Man, 12, Yes I Would, 11, Floating in the Fourth, 10, Not Miserable, 9, State Hospital, 8, A Good Reason to Grow Old, 7, An Otherwise Disappointing Life, 6, Good Arms versus Bad Arms, five, Late March, Death March, four, Nitrous Gas, three, Woke Up Hurting, two, The Modern Leper, and one, Die Like a Rich Boy and Death Dream. Beautiful. We'd love um, to see it. So I did a top 20, and I decided as soon as you said top 25 to just say do 25 as well. Um, although you technically did 26, so I'm going to let you have that. Um, uh, so at 25, Lump Street, 24, Acts of Man, 23, uh, a, a non-album cut I didn't talk about, It's Christmas, So We'll Stop, which is just an awesome song. Um, mm. 22, Good Arms versus Bad Arms. 21, No Real Life. 20, The Wreck. 19, Death Dream. 18, another B-side, Fun Stuff. 17, My Backwards Walk. 16, Not Miserable. Uh, 15, Keep Yourself Warm. 14, Blood Under the Bridge. 13, Fuck This Place. 12, Old Team. 11, The Wood Pile. 10, The Oil Slick. 9, Yes I Would. 8, Foot Shooter. Seven, The Modern Leper. Six, Things. 
five nitrous gas, four poke, three four hundred bones, two bird is bored of flying, and one state hospital. We did it! it. It's done. Oh, it always feels done. like such a, Every Fuck. time I do this, it feels just like such an achievement reaching the end of it. I, th- this, yeah. was specifically, this was the yeah. most grueling one to prepare for. Not that I regret yeah. it at all. I'm very glad we did this. Like, just, I feel it, like the thing, the, the last something three ones of these, is out of me. Yeah. The last three ones I've done of these, it's been this, it's been Sufyan, it's been against me. And all of those have just been intensely emotional. (laughs) Yeah, that'll do it. Hopefully a little bit easier, though. Our next uh, uh, B-Size discography episode is going to be on Portis Head, much shorter and more to the point. Um, But anyway, in the meantime, Fighting Rabbit, what do you think of their albums? What do you think of all the projects we discussed today, or any of them? What are your favourite Frightened Rabbit songs? What are your favourite Frightened Rabbit albums? Get on touch. Let us know engage <laughs> let's do this yeah just to end on a slightly more poignant note um we are wrapping up this episode and i feel like it would be remiss of us to wrap it up without again acknowledging just how beautiful the musical life of scott was and um i hope wherever he is he is feeling better yeah yeah beautifully said rest in peace sky rest in peace Okay. Uh, um, <laughs> it feels a bit appropriate to do a finish after that. Rock um, over London. Rock, rock on Chicago. Chicago. Rock on Chicago. Eclipse. Intense mints. <laughs>